Thank you so much, TJ. Good morning, Board of Commissioners and to the citizens of Douglas County. We will call this October, uh, this August 17th, 2020 work session to order. And uh, before I start, I would like to just acknowledge the presence of our commissioners. And when I call your name in your district, if you could just respond, whether you're present or not. Um, district 1 Commissioner Henry Mitchell, the third. Madam Chair, I just talked to Henry. He's going to be a tad late, but he's coming. Okay, thank you. District 2 and Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson. Present. Okay. District 3, Commissioner Terenia Carthen. Uh, I see Commissioner Mitchell just joined us, and I see you, Commissioner Carthen. Okay. And Commissioner Guider, District 4. Commissioner Ann jones Guider, Present. Okay, so we have all our commissioners here this morning. Thank you all for being here and joining us. Due to the continuation of the coronavirus pandemic, the latest and also the latest increase in the spread of the virus in the community, today's meeting is being held virtually again. And again, we will stay, remain in lockstep with the governor's executive orders who have, those orders have been extended to September the 10th. And Board of Commissioners, we will, our um, next meeting, uh, should I say in this certainly tentatively, uh, would be September the 15th uh, in person. But we will continue to monitor the uh, governor's orders and then uh, anything is subject to change at this time. For uh, obvious reasons, it is important for us to remain vigilant uh, with washing our hands um, on a continuous base basis watching our social distancing, and also last but not least, uh, it is highly recommend that you, recommended that you wear a mask while in public. Um, clerk, thank you so much, uh, Board of Commissioners and Citizens. Clerk, do we have a public any public comment this morning? Yes, ma'am, we have one citizen to sign up, and that is Ms. Novi Mitchell. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, clerk, could you read our instructions for joining you know, before Ms. Novi Mitchell? here. Yes, ma'am. Um, first off, we ask that citizens mute and everyone mute, mute your phones, or if you are on Teams, please mute your video and mic until your name is called. Please keep your comments to under three minutes. The clerk will notify you if your time is up and ask you to wrap up your comments. So um, please just finish up your sentence at that time. Once the public comment is over, if you choose to remain in the meeting, Please just keep your um, phones muted or your team's uh, video and mics muted for the entire time of the meeting. Uh, if you wish to leave the virtual meeting, you may do so at any time, and you may continue viewing the meeting on live web stream on DCTV23 on uh, our Facebook page. So um, I will go ahead and see if Ms. Mitchell is on the line. Are you there, Ms. Mitchell? I am. Okay, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, this is, uh, I, I thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, for the opportunity to come before you today. Uh, the issue concerning me is the potential of raising the millage rate, which equates to the increase in our property taxes, which is very serious and concerning matter to a lot of the Douglas County citizens. As you're aware, this pandemic has caused some emotional, mental, physical, and financial stress for a lot of your constituents here in Douglas County. Although you may be able to pay your uh, bills and obligations because you still have your jobs and your paycheck, there are many of your constituents that do not have that luxury. Uh, my belief is that this burden of paying uh, an additional $500 or $1,000 in property taxes which I have, uh, has, uh, could potentially cause some people to lose their homes. Uh, the current tax bill uh, and the market values have increased, and this increase is due November 2020, three months. Uh, I don't know why the commissioners, uh, uh, Madam Chair and the commissioners, cannot wait on those collections instead of just adding, considering adding more burden to us. I implore you to reconsider and not increase the property taxes uh, by increasing um, 
the mortgage payment for some of your constituents, adding additional burden to them. And for some, ownership may be out of reach. Uh, continue to look at each department. I'm sure you have. Continue to each look at each department uh, within the county. And starting with the commissioner chair and the commissioners, reduce your budget from two to four hundred dollars each uh, to show the other departments that you are willing, has been willing to assist with that. I appreciate the opportunity. I think I uh, thank uh, Commissioner Mitchell and Robinson a few years ago when they uh, voted against uh, the millage rate, uh, in the increase in the millage rate, uh, knowing that their their constituents uh, were uh, very upset about that. And they were looking at uh, what happens, especially with um, some people who are choosing to, to buy medication or food, an additional 15 or $20 is still out of reach for them. So please consider these individuals as well. Thank you again for the opportunity and make it a great day. Thank you so much, yes, uh, Mrs. Mitchell. Appreciate your contribution to uh, county government. Board of Commissioners, uh, next we have some presentations that are coming before us this morning. We have three presentations. We have a COVID-19 update uh, and Dr. Meemark and Lisa Crossman will be presenting this morning. And certainly wanted to certainly dovetail on our educational campaign. It appears that we are making some progress and I'm so excited about the news that Dr. Meemark and Lisa Crossman have for us regarding um, the uh, mitigation of COVID-19 in Douglas County. With no further ado, Dr. Meemark, are you on the phone? Are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, I'm old. You have the floor. Thank you so much. And then um, Lisa Crossman's with me. Let me see if I can get my presentation going. Great. All right. Thank you for having us today. I um, wanted to go ahead and just give you a COVID-19 update. So we do want to let you know the state of the county as it relates to COVID-19. Um, cases right now are um, 2,848 uh, confirmed cases in Douglas County. Doc, Dr. Meemark, you here with um, we 58 days um, um, that we've actually seen um, uh, uh, improve. Is it not working? It's choppy. Choppy. So if you could, uh, everybody, one, if you could mute your phones, please. It's choppy. Okay, I'm sorry. See if I can uh, get this. Dr. Mimar, are you Wi Fi? Okay. Or you... Uh, let me see. I'm getting. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she, she's probably Wi Fi and, and another. Yeah, I apologize about that. Can you hear me a little bit? Okay. Yes, I apologize. Let me see if I can switch the Wi Fi to another yes. um, Wi Fi that I have. We can hear you now. Okay, let me. Now let her switch. Okay, it's a pretty she can get it. It's a school, so I'm trying to work from home, and <laughs> it's giving me a little challenge this morning. Hold on a second. bit better. Okay. Okay. All right. Is that a little better? I think that's a whole lot better. Can you? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So um, just to reiterate, we have um, 2,848 um, cases from last night and um, 58 um, deceased right now in Douglas County. So 
Today was one of the first days I've actually seen in the last um, few weeks, actually, where um, hospital numbers are looking a little bit better. And so we, um, in Douglas Hospital, we continue to have some um, critically low inpatient beds, but um, the critical care beds have actually actually improved a little bit. And so there's a little room there, and that that is um, definitely good, good news and uh, good to see. Um, we will see some increase in the deaths because that's a lagging indicator. And so what that means is, you know, after you get your cases and then the hospitalizations will follow and then deaths will unfortunately follow that. Um, so there has been a slight increase in the number of deaths because we had a very big surge in cases towards the end of July, I mean, end of June and mid July. So this is where you see the, the cases and in the blue line, you see Douglas County and you see that we had um, quite a surge back in about mid-July and it seems to be coming down a bit. Now, the last two weeks, you kind of have to chop those off because um, the, the cases keep rolling in. So they're a little bit late. So you can see that we've come off of a higher plateau and it, it's coming down slightly. For those of you that um, have not gotten a chance to see DPH's new website or the website, you can see these updates that were made. You can see how um, you can click on the county in Douglas County on the map on the left, and it'll give you the total cases and as well as the cases per 100,000 over the last two weeks. That's a number that, that seems to be um, something that everybody's kind of looking at because it gives you a state of affairs and in what direction that we're heading. So you see that the number is 323. And to put that in perspective, when we were at our spike back in um, July, it was over 400 cases per 100,000. And that, so it's going in the right direction, that's one thing. But you know, to give you some perspective, um, anything over 100 cases per 100,000 is considered high, high transmission. So we're still three times over the high, but it is going in the right direction and everything that we're seeing is, is supporting that. So very good news, and we need to continue doing what we're doing to keep bringing that number down. When you look over on the right side, you can see the, the um, cases and the graphic on um, date of onset. So you look at that and you see that big spike that we had in July, and then you see it's coming down some. So everything seems to indicate we are going in the right direction. Um, I wanted to let you know about testing. So testing has been um, going really well. We previously, so it's been it's been a kind of a huge battle to get all the testing in order. So um, either we did not have enough access to testing, and then when we did, the testing got overwhelmed, and then um, we had big delays in testing, um, of getting the results. We we seem to have hit our sweet spot right now, which is really nice. Um, over 7,000 tests have been done in Douglas County by Cobb and Douglas Public Health alone. Um, the, some of you may know we do have our um, site, the fixed site over at Douglas Health Center, but we've added a bunch of mobile sites as well so that we can have better access. One of the other very key indicators that we look at is a, um, a positive percentages over the last um, few weeks. And so what I've seen in the last week or so is that um, um, the, the positive rate for Douglas County has been between 1 and 8 percent, and the average is 5 percent. That's Fantastic. 10% is when we really start getting worried, um, but the numbers have been coming down. So we've been seeing, a, you know, probably between five and 7%, which is really great. So if we can get less than five, it's, it's very, very good for the county. Um, we have, we talked about having increased access. We have over 3,000 tests available per week for Douglas County. And then um, the, we have great uh, result times. We are hearing um, that some people are getting the results the next day, but um, it re usually it's about two to four days, which is really good. And it's closer to two, which is really what we want to hear. So we've made some great strides in testing. I'll turn it over to Lisa to continue with the, um, some more of the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for having us this morning um, and for everything that everyone, our residents are doing to help bring these rates down. We are so excited that we are going in the right direction. Wanted to give you a couple updates. As Dr. Meemark said, we have our, we are offering over 3,000 test appointments each week in Douglas County. We've dramatically increased those opportunities since the end of July. Um, I would be surprised if uh, someone who needed a test could not get in today somewhere or at the very least tomorrow. Um, we're offering our Douglas Public Health Center, as you can see, Monday through Saturday, 7.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. 
We've partnered up with uh, CORE, which stands for Community Organized Relief Effort. They're an international organization that goes around to uh, provide disaster relief, and they've been going around the country for the last several months offering testing. And so we've partnered up with them uh, to offer a number of locations in Douglas County or, um, or for Douglas residents. So you can see a few of the options there. Um, we're at the South Cobb Epicenter, which is not in Douglas County, but we do have a lot of residents that seem to be coming over there because of the ease of access off of I-20. We're offering uh, testing at the Douglasville Town Center location on Stewart Parkway every Wednesday and Friday from 1 to 7. Uh, Word of Faith Worship Cathedral, and then uh, a week or so ago, we were at the Douglas County Courthouse, and we tested almost 300 residents at that event. Um, and we're looking at some other locations this week. Our Douglas Core uh, model is a cell swab, um, nasal, shallow nasal swab. And so if you go over to the uh, Douglasville Town Center location, that's, you'll see that method being used. And then we've partnered up with our Wellstar Congregational Nurses, and they're working with our public health staff to offer two to three events a week in Douglas County. Um, we've been pretty regular out at the New Mountaintop Baptist Church. Um, Saturday, I think it was Saturday, we were at the Crossroads Church, and then today we we're over at the Pantry. Um, and so you can find all of these locations on our Cobb and Douglas Public Health website um, to find the newest appointments available. And then we also partner with Metro Atlanta Ambulance Services to go to some of our high-risk locations, like they've gone to some of our homeless shelters and long-term care facilities when we need to send paramedics in to help do those tests. Um, and so that's continuing throughout this. All right, next slide. Um, I did want to bring attention to the new executive order. Uh, many of you know that Governor Kemp signed a new executive order on Saturday. Um, as um, Chairman Jones said, she, uh, the executive order for the public health state of emergency was extended through September 10th. And then he also extended the safety measures through the end of August. So if you look at this document, and I've got the link available for folks, you can always get it through Governor Kemp's uh, website. But um, here are some of the highlights of that executive order. One, it just reinforces the governor's authority over a public health emergency, um, and it prohibits local actions that are more or less restrictive than the executive order. Except on this most recent executive order, it does carve out the opportunity for local um, school systems and local municipalities and counties to have mask mandates as long as they those counties are over the threshold requirement. Um, as Dr. Meemark mentioned, high threshold is defined as greater than um, or equal to 100 positive cases per 100,000 residents. Um, and so Douglas County is above that. Um, it also uh, adds some um, additional guidelines. First of all, it maintains all the business guidance that was in previous executive orders, but it adds a couple of things. One, it allowed the Georgia Board of Dentistry to award temporary licenses to applicants. Mainly that's because their exams have not been able to be hosted, um, and it allows them to go to start practicing and have temporary license as long as they are working under a licensed dentist. And then previously in the executive orders, it had some recommendations for summer schools. Uh, those are now school requirements in this executive order, and it still gives local boards of health authority over mask and social distancing guidance as is practical. Uh, next slide. This is just the link. If anybody wants to go, this is an active link that'll take you right to that current executive order. All right, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Meemark. Great, thank you, Lisa. So, um, you know, we had talked about just being on the right trajectory and we're, we're really excited about that coming off of um, some high stress times for everybody. And so we wanted to reiterate the steps that um, need to be taken to, to continue going in this direction. We talked about the, the three W's of wearing your mask and we're so excited. Every time I drive around in Douglas County, I see all the signs out and, and the reminders and that's great. So um, continue to watch your distance. So trying to keep at least that six feet distance away from other people, 
continuing to wash your hands. And um, when you go to the CDC, avoid large crowds is a, is a big reminder as well. We have seen many an outbreak that have started in large crowds, and that includes weddings and funerals and parties. And so it's really important not to become complacent with that. Um, continue please taking caution if you are high risk. So that includes people that, are, that have those chronic uh, medical conditions who are elderly or immunocompromised. When we review our death records, they continue to be in elderly folks, but um, a lot of medical issues. And um, you know, one of the few big ones are diabetes and hypertension and obesity as well. And you may not think of those as um, you know, uh, medical conditions that will put you at such high risk, but we are certainly seeing that. And, um, and I'm seeing um, some patients who um, uh, are undergoing cancer treatment please be very cautious, even if you don't go out, but who's coming to see you um, is very important to keep yourselves protected. Remember these steps over the holidays. We have another holiday coming up and um, we saw a tremendous spike at our last holiday. And we really wanted to make sure everybody was aware that you know, for us to continue to try to get life going back as normal, that we really gotta continue being cautious. Continue to monitor for um, vaccine progress. We, we are cautiously hopeful that that will be coming at the end of the year and we are helping to prepare for that as well and to um, um, administer vaccines to our community. And please just don't become complacent. We have put a lot of hard work as a community into this and we've all made so many sacrifices. So um, we're just asking to just keep going um, a little longer so that we can keep this reduced and hopefully get our kids back into school soon. And Dr. Meemark, I just wanted to add uh, to step off of uh, Chairwoman Jackson Jones' comment early on um, about the mask campaign. Cobb and Douglas Public Health has worked with Douglas Emergency Management to uh, um, secure uh, hundreds of thousands of masks. And we've made those available through the county properties and also through the city of Douglasville. So there are many locations where nonprofits, where individual residents and folks can get masks if they don't have one now. Okay, thank you very much. And um, at the end of our presentation, we can certainly uh, take any questions if there are any. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meemark and uh, Lisa uh, Crossman. We appreciate this presentation this morning. Board of Commissioners, you have any questions or comments for Dr. Meemark or Lisa? Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Carthen. You have the floor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, either to uh, Ms. Crossman or to Dr. Meemar, are we anticipating um, doing any walk up mobile testing? Because we do have quite a bit of people who uh, do not have their own cars within the county that are looking to be tested as well. So, Commissioner, um, with our core testing and our public health sites, if we have folks, we prefer for them to be pre-registered on our website, but all of those locations allow for folks to register on site if they can't um, register ahead of time. And we have staff that'll uh, uh, make them available to register. We also have had a number of folks who will walk up at our locations and we'll just kind of get staff and, and take them over to the tent to get them tested. Okay, so walk-ups are allowed if you mm -hmm. do not have a car to drive through. Walk okay, and is our model now that we are all doing the self-swab as opposed to the deep larynx uh, testing? Do you want to take that yeah. one, Dr. Mark? Yeah, so um, the so just for people to know, because I, I know this is actually a very serious issue for a lot of people. Um, the Douglas Health Center continues to do the deep nasopharyngeal swab. So all the way back, the little brain tickle. Um, but the, um, the core sites, the mobile sites, are actually all just the shallow nasal. So they'll go in, you do it yourself, into each nostril. So that's good. But we are moving towards the model as a state. We're all moving over to the shallow nasal, so but that won't be for yet another few weeks. So, but we have probably more sites than not that will do the shallow nasal. But please make sure you double check; it's not on our website. But the uh, the health center is the one that does the nasal pharyngeal, and the other ones uh, um, are the shallow ones. <laughs> that is good to know. So, as we had you on the line, I just wanted constituents to hear that. Do both 
types of testing give accurate results or or close to uh, accurate results yeah. possible? Yes, yeah, so they're both validated to give accurate results. And so, but um, you know, if uh, you don't get a good sample for whatever reason, there is a chance of not catching it. You know what I mean? So it's only as good as it is that day, but um, they have been validated against each other and done quite well. Okay. And during the time that you have been tested, uh, from the time that you're tested to the time that you get your results, can you talk about should we quarantine if you feel as though you may have come in contact with someone who could possibly who who was tested positive for COVID nineteen? So that's a great question. Uh oh, you froze on us. <laughs> you froze, Dr. Mimar. I'm in my frozen. Oops, who's frozen? There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, did you want to answer that on the different scenarios on um, getting tested and quarantining? Lisa? <laughs> sure. Yes. So, okay. Sorry, Dr. Meemark. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were talking to the commissioner of clarifying her question. So, a couple of things, uh, Commissioner. One is, if you are identified as a direct contact of someone who has tested positive, so for example, you are have been within six feet for more than 15 minutes of someone who is a lab confirmed positive, we are going to ask you to quarantine for 14 days. If you develop symptoms in those 14 days, we'd love for you to come in to get tested the day you develop symptoms. If you don't develop symptoms, we would like you to come in on about day 10 to get tested um, to just confirm. But please be aware that those tests, positive or negative, do not change your 14 day quarantine requirement. OK, so that's the first thing. The second is if you are just feeling poorly, right? You're just not feeling great and you think, oh, let me go rule this out and you want to come get a COVID test. You're not required to quarantine or isolate just because you don't feel well until you get the results of that test. What I would just say is this is a time for folks to be cautious. If you are not feeling well, for any reason, this is not the time to be a hero and go to work or to go to school. Um, this would be the time to stay home at least for the 24 hours fever free or 24 hours symptoms until you get those results back. And then if they're repositive, then you would start your 10 day isolation. Um, if they're negative, then you go back to your doing things um, as usual. Um, unless you were the direct contact, but doing things as usual, um, just watching your symptoms. Anything you want to add, Dr. Meemark? Okay. Did that answer your question, Com Commissioner? It okay. does, and I think it clears up for a lot of our constituents in the county who kind of wander back and forth about that. So thank you guys so much. Uh, with that, Chairman Jones, I yield the floor. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. Any other questions from the board, Board of Commissioners? I just have okay, Commissioner Guider. Yes, okay. uh, and I don't know which one of you ladies uh, I should uh, apply this to, so either one of you can answer. Okay, so um, our death rate per cases is what two percent um, per population. Our cases per the pop total population is two percent, but you're saying. Our hospitalization per cases is like 12% or something like that. So, um, do you know the um, percentage of elderly people that are hospitalized and how long is the normal hospital stay? You know, I'm going to have to get that information for you of um, people that are. Are you saying the people who are considered elderly that get COVID that get hospitalized? Well, whoever gets hospitalized because of COVID mm -hmm. um, out of the cases is, <clears throat> is 336 is what you said was mm -hmm. the numbers that was up there. Mm -hmm. um, how long is their stay? Because I know somebody that went to the hospital and they're elderly and they were they're sent home now and they're mm -hmm. doing fine. 
So yeah. just wondered how long the hospitalization is normally. Well, yeah, so it depends on the, the, the how critical uh, the nature of the uh, illness this time is. So you remember in our first wave, we actually had um, um, more elderly people that were being uh, hospitalized at that time. And then the second wave, we actually had younger people that, um, or the second spike that we had, younger people that were being hospitalized. And so, and they were less serious, requiring less critical care um, um, service than um, our previous um, group. And so, but now it's evening out a little bit more, but um, still they, they've made so many advances this time around that the hospitalizations are shorter and they, um, are less critical than they were the first time around. So, um, but I can get you the kind of exact numbers. I, it was several days, but it depends. Like if you are, you know, how critically ill you are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I yield back. All right, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Madam Chair. Guidance. Yes, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to piggyback on some of the commentary that was made earlier, some of the questioning by my, my peers. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're considered what's in what? Phase two? Is that accurate, Dr. Mimar? Well, well, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question because uh, there's, there's a lot of discussion that we never came off the first wave. That right. we uh, had a, sp a spike, and then kind of we've had our second surge, but we really never did get get down to um, low levels of the virus. We've come, we remained high for a while. Okay, that's that's fair enough. You don't you don't have to go further, right? So we're in phase one, and we're, we're learning a lot. Uh, you know, I'm going to go back to my initial, you know, versus standing in the corner versus testing and data. Now we're we're smarter for it. We're getting clarification from the governor on orders. Uh, we're, I'm hearing that, okay, so we can locally uh, mandate based on our local needs. Uh, again, sticking with the guidance, right? It's all relative, right? Um, uh, the nuances that is necessary to keep our citizens safe. Um, I do acknowledge the educational, uh, while there may be some questioning about the, the cost associated with educating um, our local constituents, it's necessary. If everybody would be conscious in their awareness, we probably would all be saints and we probably all would walk up out of here with, with no issues. But programming and education is very necessary. And so I do appreciate and applaud the efforts of the administration for educating. Dr. Mimar, I appreciate you guys weighing in on the content uh, associated with some of the educational pieces because we're not playing with this. I, I appreciate some people politicize this, but we are dealing with life. And so for that, for the smallest efforts, I do appreciate it. Which gets me finally to my point, with the cost associated with this. The last time we met, uh, Dr. Mima, I don't think you were here, but I, I've got to get, because we're we're going into public hearings right now, and, and, and right now we've got two things, our normal operating expenses associated with conducting government, as well as obviously uh, on top of the pandemic, keeping the two very separate. But the last time that we were here, we were asked the question to put up basically a third of our remaining um, COVID um, grant. And I just, we may not be able to get into it today. Um, and I think the way it was left is that, well, Cobb versus Douglas, 25, 75%, we're gonna spread this, but I'm like, okay, this is my one question. Well, wait a minute, they got 183 million. We got 5 million. Why are we giving up a third of ours? Or are we taking a third of their money? I want you to answer that. Don't answer it now, unless you really know. Um, I don't want you to walk into something, but it's something that while I appreciate, hey, look at us, look at how well we're doing, there's still a cost. There's a question, well, how much money did the federal government give public health via the state? How well are we doing currently with our operations with public health for the money we currently contribute? And one more time, if we're split between Cobb and Douglas, they got 183 million, I got 5 million. Why am I putting up a third of my money? For my location versus, the, are you taking a third of theirs? Don't answer that because I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but it's something that we've got to answer. Um, as, and it's going to move fast. We, we won't have time to do a lot of audits and things like that. It's going to go fast, but it can't just be an ask for the sake of it. That's a lot of money and we do have to balance this and we have to show the public that we really do comprehend what's being asked. 
So with that being said, I have no further questions. I'm going to yield the floor in case my other peers want to say something, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's it. I'm good. All right. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments from the board? I just had one closing. Oh, Commissioner no, Mitchell. No, you can go ahead. No, you go on. I, I was just going to close out. No, you go on, Commissioner. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell, you have the floor. Just, just one quick question. Uh, with the, the new uh, testing from the COVID saliva type testing, are we, are you guys in, in, are we doing that nowadays as opposed to the nasal, you know, you, you scratching up on brain cell <laughs> to get to it to test? Or are we, are we looking at the newer methods of testing and, and, and that rapid response to that type of testing? Or are we are not there yet? Just curious. Just, just that one question. That's a great question, Commissioner. So um, we are not there yet, but I know there is a lot of discussion at the state level about um, these kind of um, technologies. And so um, they're, I know they're looking into different things right now, but uh, we're not quite there to deploy that quite yet. Got it. So, so I guess basically we'll have to uh, kind of find that part of it a little bit later. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. All righty. Thank you so much, back, Commissioner. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. I just wanted to close out with I heard uh, uh, Dr. Meemark and both Lisa. You said 100 positive cases per 100,000 uh, in terms of uh, whether about mask, and it says sounds like Douglas County is way over our threshold. Uh, if you could just get me that data, I certainly want to engage in conversations with my commissioners to to get, just start brainstorming what we need to do to to move forward. Uh, certainly, it sounds like the governor has given each uh, jurisdiction, or should I say municipality, the ability to look at their numbers and make decisions based on those numbers. So if you all, if you could get me that data, I certainly want to meet with my commissioners and have some discussions to see which direction we want to go. Okay. I really appreciate your, uh, your, uh, presentation today it was wonderful. And we appreciate, uh, all the things that you're doing to keep Douglas County, uh, citizens safe. And we really appreciate everything and your staff as well. So you all have a great day and thank you for just uh, taking this uh, invitation on a moment's notice. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we're gonna move on to our next presentation. We have a presentation and a splashed update by Terry Gable. Mr. Gable, are you there? I see you. I am. Madam you Chair. have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much and good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Terry Gable and I'll be doing the August splashed update. Um, for the for the group, and let me see if I can get the uh, the presentation up. Um, okay, can um, please let me know if uh, having problems viewing that or or hearing me, and I'll um, I'll get started. Madam Chair, I do have David Good is going to do a a quick update on our local vendors and our DB participation at the end. Uh, David, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Uh, with that said, uh, Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, we'll be I'll be reporting on the work completed through um, ju uh, July and then reporting on the June revenues for this month. The um, the totals that we're looking at right now that were invoiced uh, at the end of July uh, is right at 40. $3.4 million that's been invoiced out in the program overall. Uh, fire and EMS did not change uh, that much. Uh, we had a, a few small invoices that went out, so they, they're still hanging in right at $20 million total. Transportation uh, did not, uh, didn't change that much either. We had a few small invoices that came in. Uh, they are starting to ramp up, obviously, with um, a couple intersections and the resurfacing program. So as we move into the remaining um, calendar year uh, for 2020, uh, they'll start going up uh, in, in numbers. And then the uh, the, the biggest uh, jump in, in, um, in invoicing came in the parks program. As everyone knows, we have um, we have a lot of work going on, several vertical buildings going up in and the parks program, we invoiced out just a little over a million dollars in parks. So everything is progressing um, uh, fairly well at this point with the program. Uh, the good news uh, during uh, such a difficult time with the pandemic going on is the revenues continue to 
Um, to be good, June revenues uh, came in at 2.35 million, um, which is, uh, if you compare that to the projections, uh, we were several, several hundred thousand dollars over that, obviously. So for the year four, the SPLOS totals um, are right at 6.6 .6 million. And again, that's just for year four, which is right at about a half a million dollars over what, uh, what the projections were at the beginning of the program. So good news there. Let's um, keep our fingers crossed and hopefully that that trend will continue and we can continue to, to build a, a good solid base uh, for the program as we move into the, the fifth and sixth year. Uh, just looking at the graph, um, you can see that this June revenue was it tied in the past 12 months. It, it tied uh, uh, this for the second highest month the last 12 months. Uh, if you took out um, December of last year, which we had a real good month. Uh, so again, it's, it's good numbers and we'll continue to track it and monitor the program to make adjustments as we, as we need to and as we need to bring before the board uh, if that happens. Uh, looking at the, all four SPLOS years, again, we're in, uh, we're in the third month of year four. Uh, so the total for, uh, for all three years plus the three months and four is right at $82.5 million. Compared that to 78.7, which was the projected number for the overall program, we're over that by $3.7 million. So that's continuing to hold in, in, in a, with a slight in, uh, increase um, since we started year four. I am re looking back uh, at the, the bond obligation. Uh, going into year four, we had an outstanding, outstanding balance of $21.6 million. As I, as I reported last month, uh, we'll be paying back this year $17.3 million. The first one will be in October 1st of this year uh, at $509,000. And then um, in April of 2021, we'll make the much larger payment of $16.8 million. And this will, as we move into year five, and as I've reported, that'll be the smallest payment uh, of the total program payback. Um, for the bond obligations, uh, which will be right around four million dollars for that last payment, but we're uh, we're working through this one, and as we've done in the past, the um, the revenues will be held until we get the seventeen millions collected, and then after that, we'll we'll start counting the paygo money. So with that, um, we'll move into uh, if there's no questions on revenue right now, um, we'll move into some project updates that we've had since last month. Um, in the fire program, the countywide digital radio system, I'm glad to report that we are, it is 100% complete. Um, the chief in, in Tusa has signed the uh, final acceptance letter, releasing them, and uh, we are, we've, the, the system is 100% operational. Uh, everyone is very happy with it. We have, I think everybody's very satisfied with the job that Motorola has done in Tusa. And with this system, and we, it's just been a good partnership with all of them. I'm sure the chief has, has only had good comments of, with, to, to you guys about the, about that project, uh, but it's gone very well. We've got the last invoice from Motorola and it's in the process of being uh, pro, uh, uh, paid as we speak. So uh, this will be the last month uh, that we'll, we'll report on it as, as far as Motorola's um, part of it. Um, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll count this one off as a, a completed project for the program, which is one of our, uh, our bigger projects uh, overall. So a great accomplishment there by everyone in the chief and Motorola and the whole team really, it really come out uh, as, a, as a good job. Uh, the, amb the ambulance procurement 2020, uh, the bids are due uh, August the 20th this week. And the chief have been, chief and Scott will be working towards uh, getting those in production. Uh, the fire truck for 2020 uh, is the purchase order has been uh, approved for this for the fire truck. The chief and them are going up to Ohio uh, to visit with the vendor as soon as they can get that coordinated. Uh, that trip will be what will kick off the production date for it. Once they get up and 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 get the final specs uh, agreed on, and as you know, these these uh, vehicles take uh, uh, quite a long time to to. Uh, Manufacturer, and it'll be next towards the end of next year, maybe in the fall, before we take delivery 
of the fire truck. But at this point, everything is moving uh, as expected and we're ready to get um, get them started. Staff vehicles, um, or we, uh, the chief and them are expected, it was two uh, F-250s. The chief and them are expecting them to be delivered any day now. They're a little bit ahead of schedule. We were expecting them in the fall of this year, but they last report was they were coming in a little bit early. They were two F-250s, as I said, and they'll be equipped with whatever special equipment they need uh, for the purpose they were, uh, we, we purchased them for. And then we'll um, we'll get those out uh, out for uh, for um, for the chief and them to start using. And then the last project that we have with the chief uh, and Scott at this time is is uh, as I've been reporting on is Station Eleven. Uh, it is still in the design phase. We have made uh, uh, progress with it. And I mentioned this last month. We had to uh, get enough design data in. Uh, to make some decisions, if it was feasible to, uh, to, to, for the sewer system hookup with WSA, which at this point, that's a decision that uh, we have made. Um, the cost looks like it's even came down with some, some adjustments we have made in it. And we're looking at, at that and, and hooking up the WSA with the sewer system and the overall cost for the project that the engineer has given us. We are now within uh, what looks to be within budget. So we've given direction to the civil engineer to move forward right now and starting the um, starting the final design work. What now will happen is, is we're working, um, the, the sewer line will, will have to take advantage of State Route 92's right of way. So we'll be working with GDOT, obviously, and WSA through this uh, to get everything worked out, but we'll have to get a permit from GDOT, encroachment <laughs> permit. Uh, so plans will have to be submitted to them. At this point, we've had er early conversations with them. We're not expecting any issues. Uh, we may have a few, we may have some utility conflicts that we'll have to work around. But uh, I'm hoping to get this project uh, ready to let uh, towards the, the middle end of the fall. Uh, it, I, that what will drive that obviously is is um, is is GDOT and, and what um, what their time frame will be to get us a, an approved permit. Uh, if anything changes with that, uh, I'll keep the board um, updated with it. But that was, and it looks like it's, it ended up probably the best way for that project in particular. Um, the septic tank was just not going to work out uh, with, with the improvements that the chief and them were needing um, um, on the parking lot. So with that said, we'll, um, we'll move on into transportation. Uh, that completes the, the uh, updates for the chief fire and, and fire and EMS. Uh, the resourcing program for 2020 has, has finally gotten kicked off good. Um, the contractor was Baldwin uh, um, Paving, and they got started first with John West and Stuart Middle Road, uh, two, uh, two of the, the, fairly, the major corridors that we had on the, the, the list this year. Um, and from Miguel's reporting, I think both of these projects are now completed, um, and Miguel and him are, are staying right behind them with the, the maintenance paving crew and getting them topped as soon as, as Baldwin's getting them milled out and patched. So we've got a good start with, uh, I think roughly about 11 miles of paving this year with the uh, with a combination of LMIG and, and the SPLOS program um, that's well underway and certainly, uh, certainly some much needed resurfacing. John West, as most of you know, and, and Stuart Mill Road, both of them were heavily traveled roads and, and were in dire need of, of patching and resurfacing. So, Good projects to get turned back over to the public and I'm sure they'll enjoy the much smoother ride on them. Stuart Mill Road, as I've been reporting, uh, where Miguel staff is, is winding down with the right of way, we still do have two parcels that he's got to close out on. One is working with the city of Douglasville. I think we're, we're making some, some headway with that now. And then one last parcel uh, that's gonna need a sliver of right of way, but it's got to be obtained uh, that he's working with. Uh, it's right now moving a little bit slower than we had hoped, but we have gotten it down to two. You know, we started with 10, so we've made a good bit of progress with them, and I'll keep you updated uh, once we get those done. And the plans are mostly complete. It's just been a matter of getting all the right of way um, uh, certified and acquired, and then we can, we can get this project ready for um, construction. Right Star Road and John West Road is now under construction. Uh, the contractors mobilized out there. Nothing is no significant 
um, work has started yet. They are working through a few details with the utilities, uh, but they have mobilized, so we're expecting them to get started here um, here very soon um, in getting some dirt turned over and, and start the uh, the turn lanes that that are part of the project. Sweetwater Church um, is is uh, on schedule. Uh, they they're continuing to box out for the turn lanes. Uh, and I'll keep you updated with this, but really no change. They're just continuing to work. They did. They also had to work through a few uh, utility issues, but nothing now. It's just a matter of um, trying to get work done in between the, the all the showers that we continue to have um, in what normally is a dry part of our, our summer. Chapel Hill Road is uh, SEI. We have uh, Miguel's got them back on track with the uh, with the design. Uh, the board's approved to move forward with the um, um, the five lane section. I'm going to refer to it as that extended the uh, the limits now from Chapel Hill High School up to uh, Anawake Anawake Road with a four lane um, corridor and of course left turn lanes at all the major side roads. So we're back on track with that with surveying, uh, working with WSA, and and they'll be getting Miguel some some preliminary plans here soon for just initial review to make sure he's good with. Um, with them moving into um, the final plans phase. And keeping in mind, it's, it's the, the project has obviously has been extended during the design phase, but the uh, design team has, has made a lot of progress with what they've done up to this point. So none of that, none of that is wasted. It would be just a matter of, of getting the information they need on these, the pieces that we added to each end and the survey and data they need, and they'll, they'll move right into final plans once they get, um, Get that surveying done and and uh, get what they need. So uh, this project is is well on its way, uh, and hopefully we'll be getting it in the uh, the next phase. Obviously, will be uh, right of way, getting it to that point, and getting right of way plans to Miguel so they can start the uh, the right of way negotiations. Uh, Highway five continues being the design phase. No issues there. Um, it's just continuing uh, analysis of everything that's out there, uh, the utilities. And, and also moving forward with the design and figuring out the footprint and the template on it and still some unknowns. Miguel reported that, that they've got to get nailed down before they can set uh, set the final uh, design for it. Um, and we could be looking at, you know, we're obviously looking at maybe uh, some additional right of way impacts with the uh, with the turn lane being longer than uh, than what we had anticipated. But at this point, no issues, no big issues that we're able to work through. Um, what they've encountered up to this point. Post Road Bridge over Dog River, no updates there. Um, our latest uh, contacts with GDOT and their contractor is he will be in here in October. So we're looking forward to that. And Miguel and I'm sure making preparation for whatever they need to do um, to be prepared for when the contractor gets in here in October to start that bridge project and get that much needed project underway and completed. Um, maybe this year, depending on how things go with the weather, um, we can get a break in the in the rain some leading into fall. I'm sure it'll certainly help. Uh, getting into some of our, our sidewalk projects, Lithia Springs Elementary School. Uh, good to report. Um, your contractors are mobilized. You see some erosion control uh, devices that have gone up out. Uh, this is at Lithia Springs, um, and they'll be continuing to move into the construction phase and get. Uh, Get some um, some dirt moved, and you'll start seeing some sidewalk forms go in. And um, as they progress with this project, but it's great to see them out there. The same with um, Chestnut Log. This is prime uh, on this project. Uh, the Corbett Group was on the Lithia Springs. Uh, prime has also broke ground out there. Uh, you see some some work that's been done there with some drainage work. So good news there. We found we got these sidewalk projects on the way. They should be. Uh, they're small projects, uh, getting through, getting it out of ground, just like with the vertical buildings. Once they do that, uh, the uh, the project should go fairly quickly, and we're hoping to see them completed uh, by the end of the calendar year. Um, we'll just see how the, the, that certainly is dependent on weather. Um, so we'll just track that, and I'll continue to report on it and keep you updated. Our new Manchester High School project, we you know we've made. Uh, significant progress with the board approving the uh, speed reduction. Uh, the design team now is working back with GDOT. That was one of the critical things that we needed uh, for the permit to get the protect, 
protective device at uh, on 92 there. Um, we're right now looking at some form of a hawk system, but all that still got it. The revisions have got to be made on the plans now and back to GDOT. Um, and we need their, their final approval on, on that and, and to get the encroachment permit before we can, we can move this project into, um, into construction. So the plans are mostly done. It's just a matter of getting GDOT, um, satisfied with what they need and we'll be, we'll be on our way with it. Whitestone culvert, the, the project, the, the contractor has remobilized on the project. I went by there last week and saw he's about got a piece of equipment out there now. Um, so he's back, uh, back at work. The, uh, all the changes have been taking place on the plans, which you know, resulted in the reduction in cost. Um, hopefully they can get started uh, and, and uh, get this project underway. And again, maybe looking at some significant progress here uh, between now and the end of the year with the, with the culvert. Our street light projects at various locations in the county. Uh, Greystone obviously has the biggest bulk of this. Um, they have given us a schedule um, that we're, we're monitoring right now, working with them closely. Uh, they've authorized 11 locations out of their many locations that they're doing. Uh, they've got project numbers on them. They started on the last week of Ju July. They started on Simon Road and we're moving over to Bright Star Road from there. So they, uh, they, they're getting started with it and making hopefully some quick pro progress on some of these because they're, they're smaller projects. Uh, they are waiting on the I-20 interchanges. They're waiting on special ordered poles for, for I-20. Uh, as soon as we get those in, I'll keep the board um, uh, abreast of that. But uh, so that sounds like that, uh, that, that will hold them up a little bit on starting some work, so starting the lighting at the interchanges, but they're moving they're moving on the, the uh, street sections and the uh, the intersections, and they're going they're going to notify us when the projects are completed. Um, coordination now and communication looks like it's it's going much better. Uh, so hopefully we'll we'll keep uh, keep everyone uh, well informed of the progress. Georgia Powers is is um, you know, they they've got the I-20 at Post Road. Um, they they've had to go back to GDOT on on that interchange at I-20. Uh, something came up with GDOT there, so they G, it's back in GDOT's hands on trying to get the permit approved there. Once they get that, everything is good to go with uh, with the uh, the I twenty at Post Road uh, George Power project. So everything's progressing there and getting some get some actual work started and and moving forward with our street lighting. The Highway ninety two at Riverside Parkway, as I've been reporting, uh, which is good positive news that GDOT has agreed. All indications right now, uh, they're moving towards a similar project that we had at uh, State Route 92 at Mount Vernon with what they refer to as a quick re quick response project. Uh, what they, I think Miguel is looking for is final approval from uh, the state, uh, the state uh, engineering office for the funding. And once that's done, they'll, they'll start setting the project and everything, everything put together. And I'm hoping it's, it'll go similar to State Route uh, 92 at Mount Vernon, uh, and, the, and but that does depend on the the the, the bids that come in on the, the signal, and will determine the amount of Douglas County match, if any. So good news there. Uh, it's obviously a much needed uh, uh, project, a uh, uh, signal on 92 there. The, the Lee Road widening project, our big project, uh, what's turned out to be our biggest project in the program now. Um, the bids are due. Miguel's got it on the street along with the uh, procurement's um, big help. Uh, the bids are due uh, September 10th. So we've got this project out on the street. It's going to be interesting. I'm sure we're going to um, attract some pretty heavy hitters in the construction industry. As you know, it's a fairly lar large project. Um, and it's going to take several months for it for completion, but we're looking forward to seeing what the bids come in. And Miguel's been getting some good bids on the smaller projects. Let's hope that continues with with the larger projects. Also, you would think that it would, um, and we get some good bids that maybe come in under what the uh, our engineer's estimate is on the project at this point. Uh, and finally, uh, and in transportation is Maxim Road sidewalk. Um, from the GDOT project there at the intersection to uh, to the county line, Cobb County line, the the uh, the design on the project is 
it is substantially complete. I'm going to say that about 80%. Miguel, we did end up, and I think I reported it last month, with one parcel that Miguel was going to have to acquire. And again, it's just a sliver, but it is, it's something that's going to be needed. And they, he's, in, he's in the process of getting an appraisal on that. So that will have to be acquired um, before we can move into the final plan stage and, and get this project out for bid. Um, but I'm fully anticipate getting it out this this fall and, and possibly seeing this project well underway by the by the end of the year again, uh, going in towards the, the fall and, and early winter. You, as as we all know, the weather can be quite unpredictable in Georgia. So we'll see. But it'll be another um, sidewalk project that we have under construction, uh, which would be great for the for the program. And with uh, with that. Um, that uh, ends the update for transportation, and we'll move into um, into our parks program. Idyllic Park Tennis Courts uh, on schedule, on budget. Um, they have uh, it's starting to really look like tennis courts now. We got last week uh, they did the uh, some the base paving for the courts. They're getting them prepared for the final coat. Uh, that goes there, but uh, it's a good, clean site. Everything seems to be going well at this point. Uh, they did start also last week. The fencing is going up and the curb around the tennis court. So probably by next month, um, you'll see uh, you'll see some more things up. They do have they do have a waiting period that they have to let that course set um, before they can they can put the final um, topping on it. Um, so they uh, will be doing everything else but that. Um, the fencing that we've started on the parking lot, and um, of course the lights are finished. Everything with the building is done. So good, uh, good progress there. And at this point, everything is is looking is looking good. The um, multi-purpose rec center continues to make progress. Uh, I wish they would a little bit further along, but. Um, as, as as everyone else they were fighting the the you can see it's wet there so that was the day i took that picture we i'm sure we've had a rain there um they're pouring the 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 finished slab they got one more small slab to pour for the building they're pouring that this week the uh the block which is the biggest um material uh materials for this for this project is coming in this week and then we'll finally start seeing some vertical walls go up and hope and um uh, fairly quickly. And that's just the main girders that, that will that will span the gymnasium. Uh, obviously they needed to get that up first uh, before the wall started going up. But we'll get start getting those, get the slab poured and start getting those in. We'll get the block in this week and, and start up with the, uh, the with the walls. And then the uh, our senior center over in Lithia Springs um, is going well again. It's um, it's it's on schedule and on on budget. Um, TJ was kind enough to, to send the drone out and got us a drone shot. So this gives you a, a typically I'm just shooting ground shots, but it gives you a, 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 a obviously an aerial view and you can see the site as a whole, kind of how the, how the, it lays on the property. You can see the magnolias there with the grass. That's the, obviously the cemetery that we still got to clean up and, and it'll have decorative fencing around it. Um, but they are moving forward with the, the final landscaping and the next thing, uh, probably this time next month, I'll, that parking lot will be paved. So they're they're removing some of the last uh, uh, earthwork that's in the back. You can kind of see some of the grading going on. They had to lower that down to a little more of a um, to uh, existing grade where it was before. Um, and then you'll start seeing, if you remember, we've got about a 1400 foot walking trail that goes around the site. Uh, that'll start coming into into the picture next month for sure. Um, but it, uh, I think it's going to end up being real classy on the outside and obviously and for sure on the inside. Um, they are down to, um, as far as the inside goes, they're setting windows, doors, painting, um, the, the, all the flooring, some of the tile work's going in. So you can, you can just tell by that it's, you know, it's, they're getting down um, into the last phase of the project and trying to get everything cleaned up and uh, and ready to move. We are in the process of of, of um, also getting a uh, furniture package uh, uh, under procurement uh, for the building. And we're, we're working with the uh, Dawn's office in doing that with the architect. Um, 
that we that needs to kind of line up with the with the building, obviously, so that we we've got a um, got that well under under contract. Once we get once we get the building ready to open and and, and get it uh, equipped. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, well, let me. I got two more here. I don't want to forget about Bill Art and Fair Play. Um, the two projects here are are, are on schedule uh, right now on budget. Um, they're both about the same. The the um, this one's at Fair Play. It's about two or three two or three weeks ahead of of Bill Art. But if all of you know that they're identical buildings, we're starting to get some of the final. That's not the final coats, uh, but they are certain they're setting windows and, and doing some of the roof work. Um, but they're getting closer. You start seeing the buildings go up. I think they're going to look real nice. Uh, still got a good bit of work to do on the insides and, and getting them finished up. But um, everything's moving fairly well. Uh, no, no issues at this point. We've we got to get obviously the the septic tanks in, um, but that'll be done towards the end of the end of this project. We don't have a choice with the septic tanks, unfortunately. With this, it's got to it's got to be septic tanks, and they're never easy when you're working around, particularly in a park. So we got to get through that. But the buildings are progressing. Uh, very well, and um, I'll continue to keep you up, up uh, posted with uh, their progress. And now, so that uh, that wraps up the um, the update on the uh, on the projects, Madam Chair. I can go ahead and let David um, do the the vendor update if you want to do that first, and we both can take questions if that's okay with the board. It better be that'd fine. Be fine. Okay, Dave. If you wanna, if you wanna come on, I'll uh, just let me know when you want me to change the slide. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very uh, much, Chair. Uh, hello, Madam Chair, uh, Board of Commissioners, stakeholders, staff, citizens, and business owners of Douglas County. Um, again, my name is David Good, the SPLOS Communications Director. Right now, with this SPLOS program, as Terry has shown you, we're doing a whole lot right now. Right, we have 118 total vendors that have worked on a combined 81 projects. 42 of those projects are active and 39 of them are complete. As you can see, 42 of those vendors are right here in Douglas County. Another 39 of those vendors are within the surrounding uh, part of the county and everyone else is either 30 miles out or within another county. Um, next slide, Terry. And then um, as you can see, we have almost 70% of all the projects are done by, are done here locally. Uh, Terry just mentioned that we are finishing up on a Motorola project. They are right now, they were by far the largest um, company that was outside of the state of Georgia. So once this is completed, uh, the numbers will actually vastly go up uh, for local when it comes to revenue. Uh, next slide, Terry. And right now, as you can see, we have about $29 million are being are going to projects, are going to vendors locally here in Douglas County. And that represents, like I said, 55%. The rest of it, a little bit over 23 million, um, I mean, 24 million are going to companies that are outside of the local Douglas County and surrounding areas. Um, we have really worked hard before COVID started to make sure we reached out to local vendors. And once we started going virtually, we were still able to reach out to companies just by going to different events and making sure that we talk to people any type of way we could. Um, next slide, Terry. Uh, right now, uh, we have uh, DBE uh, participation. Um, it, that number has increased by 67 uh, to 67% of all the uh, projects that are active. 67% of those projects are done by either DBE or minority owned um, firms. And every time I've talked about this program, um, the percentages have gone up. I believe last month it was 66%. The month before that was 64 and before that was in the 50s. And when we started this program, uh, DBE minority participation was at 10%. Um, I believe this, and I believe that's the end of the program. I believe there's one more slide. Oh, that's it. So that's everything when it comes to uh, the vendor report. Um, thank you, Terry, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both, uh, Terry and David. Thank you so much for your presentation. Board of Commissioners, you have any questions or comments this morning? Madam no. Chair. Okay, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. All right, thank you, I'll be quick. Uh, I, I do appreciate um, uh, 
this floss update report um, because it's important. Um, obviously, it's a, a very large component of our tax dollars, even though it, it's sales tax and not necessarily property tax. I appreciate the accounting for it. Um, um, the last floss I, I, I was able to experience was obviously back in 2009, and that was a jail. Uh, and it was a much different experience to listen to that monthly report than this one. Uh, this one, um, obviously, you can hear how it actually imp impacts the community. It actually impacts uh, where citizens can see their tax dollars. See, there's a difference between spending that is internally focused, that's just government-based. It just makes employees feel comfortable. I get it. But I also think that the community needs to be, it, it can't be either or, it's got to be both. And so I appreciate this report to get that, you know, to show that accounting. That being said, moving on. All right, so um, those sidewalk projects are uh, what we started this blossom advocating back in 16. We launched in 17. I mean, it's taken almost four or five years for sidewalks, which should have been a quick win. I mean, a whole graduating class and went through high school at the time it takes this to come up. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm saying that in jest, but geez, guys, that's, that's for sidewalks. But I get it. Uh, Miguel, you know I get it. Um, Terry, I, I get it. It just seems like things that were considered quick wins, um, it, it just, it, it takes what it takes. Um, uh, but the, the, the benefits should be immediate, you know, but, but it's okay. Um, second, so I'm just acknowledging sidewalks. I'm glad to hear them moving along, et cetera. The street lights, again, another, what I want to call, should be a quick win. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't experience what we experienced uh, before you, Terry, um, in that I, um, I'm joking, but I'm not. Um, it's important that we keep up with those. Um, you mentioned that there is a list and project numbers. Yes, there's an awful lot of lights. So can you ensure that my peers, all of us, get a copy of the project lights by both Georgia Power and Greystone, who are our sections of the, we want to keep up with them. You know, I mean, it was something that they had, they, um, my peers were able to watch me go through that Riverside Light Project. And it's like, it, it, it just took, it was just sort of excruciating. But now you've got lights over the whole county. And I think while you provided that according, I mean, accurately for me, I want to make sure they get the same information so they can keep up with their light section as well and make sure it doesn't get behind. Because it was nothing like having some of my, my constituents go out there and say, well, Commissioner Robinson, the light's not up yet. And so what was happening is that you guys would come into the meetings and say that we should be this far along. My citizens immediately go out there like, well, Commissioner Robinson, there's no lights up here. There's no lamp heads. It's like, so... I think you know where I'm going. Can you yes, make sir. sure we get that, Terry? All right, yes. thank you. All right, last question, because again, I know this section tends to be longer and I know the meeting will go faster. Um, uh, transportation, Lee Road. Uh, yeah, by far that is the largest project um, in the county. And I'm glad to see that it, it, it's moving along. Um, I heard you say something about, so Chapel Hill will only go from what? The high school up to Anawakee. Um, how do we get from Anawaki to the equivalent of what Lee Road will cut over at Bomar? How did, that means there's a gap. Can, can, can Miguel, can y'all help discern the difference between that? Because I, I got stuck. Um, obviously, Anawaki is south of perhaps where the Bomar Pope connects out. So, is there any design work that's helping extend from Anawaki and Chapel Hill up to Chapel Hill and where this thing is supposed to pop out? Can y'all give me some insight on this? Are we falling short? Uh, yeah, this is Miguel, Commissioner. Uh, the uh, the overall design of for widening of um, Chapel Hill is yeah. going to encompass that entire area. However, this particular project was targeting um, providing turn lanes to a number of subdivisions that were north of the high school. Yep. And so now it's been extended somewhat, uh, about a mile's worth. However, it is still um, it is still not the complete uh, widening project. That will come later. I got you. All right. That, 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 I, you know where I'm going. I'm just laying my breadcrumbs, as I normally do, to say that we did talk about this. At some point, you're going to get there. And so you need to sort of 
be aware to plan for something that's going to come in the future. So to tie it all together. So no, you're good, Miguel. We'll, we'll probably pick this up in the transportation tomorrow. So I'll 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 defer. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to yield with that. That's, I'm good enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, Commissioner Guider, Commissioner. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Terry, uh, I would like to ask you about the Highway Five uh, right hand turn. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have to get my directions here. Uh, this is northbound Highway Five left turn, I mean right turn, right there at the old Kmart shopping center. Um, it, you, you're saying it's still in the design phase, right? Yes, ma'am. How long does this normally take? Um, if you ever travel Highway 5, especially on the weekend, you will understand where I'm coming from. Half the county that's coming from uh, the southern end of the uh, county up to the mall or, or businesses or restaurants or whatever on Highway 5, they're just backed up to Chick-fil-A waiting to go uh, around there uh, to the mall or wherever. Um, and we also have an agreement with the city that they're paying half of it. And I think we have to have it done by 2021, end of 2021, is that right? Um, I may defer to Mark Hill with that, but I think it's it's further out now. It may be 2022 or 2023, um, but it's not it's not next year. But it, it, it is there. You're right. Mark, do you have an answer? Yeah, let me. I'll check on it and I'll get you the exact date. I don't want to throw a date out there that's incorrect, but let me look it up. Okay, I was thinking it was 2021, <clears throat> but um. And it's a shame we couldn't have coordinated all this other uh, construction that's going on at that same intersection. Yes. But uh, that's just the way the government works, I guess. Um, I think I'm going to go out there and, and pave that little lane that they've had dug out for the longest time. And yeah. the red lights is hanging up there blocking the existing red lights. The new red lights are blocking the view. And you have to get up under the red lights before you can see whether or not you can turn. It's, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. But um, if there's any way of expediting this intersection, uh, it is uh, a lot of people avoid going there. I've heard a lot of people, especially in the southern part of the county, just say, we go to Carrollton. We don't want to fool with the traffic. <clears throat> Yeah. That means sales tax that we're losing. Uh, so um, if there's any way of expediting this, uh, I, it seems like it wouldn't be that complex. It's a turn lane. It's a turn lane. <laughs> Terry, you look like you want to say something. Well, and I, I'm probably not going to say what you want to hear. And Miguel <laughs> can chime in. But uh, right now, it's difficult. And uh, Miguel and I talked about this at the last staff meeting to probably be hesitant to give you like the uh, a completion time on the design phase because they still try to work through some unknowns out there as far as utilities and right of way um, impacts and with the uh, with it with the developer so they, I think they need a little bit more time and we'll be able to uh, kind of pinpoint more of some definitive dates to give you uh, but it is they've got to get they got to get beyond that uh, and then uh, they're working through it. I, I'm sure Miguel is pushing them as hard as he can push them, but it, it, it is like we, we just talked about with the sidewalk. It's just a process that, that they've got to go through. And obviously with this, they're also working with GDOT um, uh, hand in hand to get everything coordinated. Well, the property owner, I'm sure, wants to get it uh, more details in there because they want to sell the lot there. So uh, yeah. they don't know what they're going to be selling until the design plan is um, is finished. So, <clears throat> Mark, did you find out? Yes, ma'am. July 1st, 2022. July 1st, 2022. Yes, so, um, uh, and that's going to require a lot of red light stuff and the uh, moving the poles, the electrical mm -hmm. poles and everything. 
So um, we've got a long ways to go and a short time to get there. So <laughs> we need to push it as fast as we can. And with that, I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Guider. Thank you so much. And uh, certainly, um, I agree with Commissioner Guider. Certainly, some of these things that we think are quick wins, I'm not going to even use the word quick wins anymore because, again, it takes time. And I know what the design. So, I know you heard her um, outcry today. If you if you could expedite it and just see what we could do to put a little pressure on those who are working on the designs and everything to see if we can move this project forward. Thank okay. you. Any other questions from the board before I move on to the next presentation? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, yeah. Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, just real quick, and I, I want to come back to the revenues. We sort of skipped through that. Um, mm -hmm. We're, what, in our fourth year, give or take, 16. So it was 17, so it's 17, 18, 19, 20. You know what, we're in third, fourth year. And you, you, you hit on a, a point was... We're a little bit ahead of this time last year. The SPLOS is making its numbers. I don't want to discount that. I don't politicize numbers. The sky is not falling per se. Right? Congress is working. Right? When everybody went and sheltered in place, uh, along with the unemployment, that would means that People that 70% of the people who drive over to Atlanta were back over here. They weren't spending money in them high rise buildings and stuff, or after hours cocktail, they kept it over here. Right? Follow the money. We're making the numbers. Right? The numbers don't lie. Right? But I, I look at it as, but it's like a morphine drip. Right? No, this thing's sustainable now. Like it would be what we're trying to message is that while we appreciate Congress, it's like, okay, y'all gotta recognize it's it's like, okay, do y'all get it? Congress, they took care of business, two point six trillion. Like, okay, we're trying to hold this thing. We're hoping we can get through this thing. To the locals, like, okay, guys, y'all look, we're giving you a little room. They're taking care of the citizens. Like, okay, but then we still are in where we are. Right, business as usual is going along. Economics are moving along. Think about it. construction is still happening. It's both. It's moving. But please, I, I want to make sure that we're we're giving up. We're not so polarized in our capacity to be able to look at like look at the numbers, guys. Right, but but again, you kept it all here. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're not necessarily going and spending in other places. It was essential. Now we're opening back up. But like Dr. Newman, we're still in phase one now. Right, we're. we're it, it, it's still moving, but it's not sustainable by Congress. They're showing you like, okay, this thing is real, right? They can't keep dropping one to three trillion every six, seven, eight, you know, weeks. You're talking about inflation, right? We, we, I, I get our local, we're concerned about our taxes because it's more immediate. Do y'all see what that three trillion, four trillion is dropping on us? What's going to be for our grandchildren? See, Congress gets to just print money like, okay, they kicked the can, let y'all get to it later. We have to take the hit in the local. So it all streams down to us, and I'm I'm willing to have that conversation. I get it. Right? We, we don't get to print money. I get it. Right? But at the same point, let's give credit what credit is due that is holding. But what are we doing to plan and to, or and anticipate sort of like, okay, this ain't going to hold. So I just wanted to make that statement, Madam Chair. Let's not discount the fact that the numbers are holding. We did not miss our SPLOS as an indicator. So when people say, well, what happened? Oh, no, we planned that well right now. One reason is, again, Congress helped, helped us out. If it wasn't for Congress, we'd be in a much worse situation. I just want to yield that, Madam Chair, just so that there's there's balance in sort of the, the commentary that's come forth. I yield, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you so much, uh, Terry Gable and also David Good. Thank you. The presentation was very enlightening today and you all are doing a lot of good work. And so I see a lot of progress being made. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to our next presentation and, and Board of Commissioners, before I get to our next presentations, I encourage you to look at the approval, uh, to look at the minutes and we will approve accordingly tomorrow. And then it's one item and also the approval of expenses. I ask that you look at your expenses and then we will approve accordingly tomorrow. 
Uh, with that being said, I will now yield to Ron Roberts and Allison Duncan uh, for a presentation regarding Highway 78 Porter. And it's just a discussion and a, pre a preliminary analysis. With that being said, Ron Roberts, you have the floor. Oh, thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. Um, good morning to uh, you, Madam Chair and commissioners, staff and citizens of Douglas County. Yes, I'm gonna be uh, uh, going through this, uh, but I wanna introduce Allison Duncan. She's our uh, senior planner. She was at ARC for many years. Um, as uh, I just wanna say a few things before she gets started. As staff, we've made a concerted effort to kind of spread out our planning projects and grant opportunities across multiple commission districts. A um, couple examples, uh, we've applied for the Road Enhancement Beautification Council grant towards Thornton Road. And we've met with several commissioners on the application for the scenic byway 166, which was identified in our comprehensive plan adopted back in, in 2018. What's going to be presented this morning is a 30,000 foot look at 78 AKA Veterans Memorial, specifically from the Lithia Springs to the city of Douglasville. We feel that, and I'm sure that many in the county do as well, that this area has stalled economically, but that there's a uh, great potential for some positive change. While we do have an overlay for this area in our UDC that outlines prohibited uses and lays out some aesthetic guidelines, we also do not get to truly make effective change unless there's some brick and mortar project brought forward, a land disturbance permit, new business, rezoning, et cetera. As staff, we're also aware of the economic challenges facing everyone due to COVID and are sensitive and aware of financial participations at this time. But we see an opportunity to engage and begin dialogue with residents, a visioning search, if you will, and a placemaking for a blueprint of the area going forward. The thought process behind this is that for many years now, the stick or code enforcement has been the dominating control for some of the more unsightly or difficult businesses in that corridor. And then now our department would seek to engage with a more carotid approach, perhaps identifying some future endeavors that the citizens in that area could take advantage of and that the board may support at some future time when it's appropriate. There's no overnight fix to the issues along this corridor. However, there is uh, some ideas to move positively forward, which Allison's about to present. Like all good placemaking and understanding where we have been and where we are is beneficial before laying track down the tracks for the future. Uh, I wanted to thank Madam Chair and Commissioner Mitchell who dedicated their time and input on the presentation and I'll let Allison go forward with the analysis of that corridor now. Thank you. All right, Allison. great. Thank you, Ron, uh, and thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners, for the opportunity um, to share some information. I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, so can you all see that slide on your screen now? All right, I'm going to just move forward with this. This has been a really interesting project um, to jump into. Um, we did, as Ron said, look at the entire length of Highway 78. Um, and what we're going to share with you here today is a little bit of information um, that we have identified in conjunction with the ongoing zoning update. Um, so the first thing that we attempted to do is to, to place the corridor in its proper context, right? So we went back in time a little bit. Um, when, when, when Highway 78 was the east-west connector um, in Douglas County, um, so before Interstate 20, this was basically uh, the main street for Douglas County for all intents and purposes. Um, and when we really started to put together a timeline of key events along this corridor, um, we realized that a lot of what is represented along Highway 78 really goes back to not only the earliest days of Douglas County, but it carries us through to the development of the first generation of suburbs that we have here um, in the county. And so this corridor saw a lot of really cool, really iconic events um, over time. And then around 1990s, as Ron had kind of alluded to, development patterns shifted again, um, and the corridor largely began to settle into what we would call kind of a status quo. Um, so that I think is what we see today, and that's where we tried to pick up the narrative thread. Um, and I just wanted to share this image to underscore um, that that is a long corridor. That is a really long stretch of road running east to west. And so we're gonna focus on the area mostly around the Lithia Springs, end of the corridor, but I just wanted to underscore that a lot of what we're going to share with you here translates very easily um, to the end of the corridor that, that runs through the old uh, community of Winston in between Douglasville and Villarica. And so where we basically started our analysis was looking at this as a commercial corridor. So what you see here, the parcels in blue are areas that we have currently issued business licenses. And so we looked at the, the nature and the description of those businesses and we compared it um, 
to where we have existing commercial zoning, and we also looked at it in context um, of that, that overlay district that Ron had alluded to. Um, the overlay was put in place a number of years ago, and overlays are an amazing tool. Um, they can work slowly at times, and so we wanted to kind of get a, a sort of global picture of what that, that non-residential development was happening there on the corridor. But we also took a minute to kind of back away and analyze the neighborhoods adjacent to that. Um, we particularly see that in this part of the corridor, you have a lot of neighborhoods that came online in the 1960s and the 1970s, and that starts to make sense, right? If you think of our timeline, um, this really was a corridor that saw a lot of that first generation suburban development. And so when you put all of those pieces together, I think kind of the key takeaway that we would wanna share with you is this idea that the corridor and the neighborhoods really have to work together um, to reinforce the viability of this area. So it's not just a conversation about a transportation corridor, it's a conversation about how it evolved over time and how it serves the community adjacent to it. And that being said, we also kind of looked at it in the context of our comprehensive plan, and we really see that the comprehensive plan does support um, this idea that it's the neighborhoods and the corridor working together. And then finally, um, in just this initial analysis that we looked at, um, we took our property values, and this is based on tax digest, so we know that the tax digest is going to be a little bit below market value, um, but we took sort of a, an area one mile off the corridor, and we looked at the values in that area, and what we see is that about 85% of those properties have a value of under $200,000, and really about half of those have a value of under $100,000. And so I think that kind of sets up the point where we want to go next with this analysis, um, which is really how do we make the value commensurate with the potential that we know that we have on this corridor. Um, so what I have here before you are a few recommendations um, as we've thought about this of things that could be undertaken in the short term. These are all actions that can be undertaken by staff with existing staff resources. I think particularly important we would want to make sure with your blessing that we're having a conversation with those business owners and stakeholders along the corridor we would wanna make sure that we're filling out that existing context. We've shared a little bit with you today, um, but we would wanna make sure that we kind of took that to the next step. Um, we have some really good housing recommendations. In 2017, y'all may recall that the Bleakley Advisory Group returned a good report to the county um, talking about some of the, the housing recommendations they would have. Um, and then since then, we've got some strong recommendations coming out of Metro Atlanta Housing Strategy, as well as um, an analysis of our current zoning codes that ARC has provided through the Community Development Assistance Program. So we think, as I had said previously, a lot of this works kind of hand in glove with those zoning revisions um, that we will start sharing with y'all in the upcoming months. And then I think as Ron had alluded to, looking at the market opportunities, the placemaking opportunities, and how we could bring some of those things about. So we're really just planning for that viable redevelopment um, in an incremental way along the corridor. Um, that being said, I'm going to conclude on a couple of other programs that may be of interest to you. Um, what I had shared previously was all uh, things that could be uh, handled by staff with existing resources, but we think that there are some good programs through our state partners and our nonprofit partners um, that could really enhance uh, the information that we would be able to return about this corridor. Um, so I'm going to pause there uh, and see if you have any preliminary thoughts, questions, or feedback on what we've shared at this time. Board of Commissioners, we have any questions for Allison or either um, Ron? Okay. No. no questions, Allison. Okay, okay. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I, I'll i be quick. I want to acknowledge the fact that you mentioned the corridors, um, uh, Lithia Springs, all the way up to what downtown Douglasville. I'm going to yield to my colleague, Commissioner Mitchell, to, to provide thought leadership on that, though we probably share it. He probably has. Uh, predominance of it and probably has um, obviously more wisdom and than I do in that area. So I'm going to yield to that. Allison, I've got a question directly for you then for, to, to, to segment. You mentioned 1990. I think Ron Roberts mentioned it. You sort of hit it. And that's during a time period which I um, you know, came of age here, you know, my entire adult life from 1990 to 2020, 30 years, right? And, and, I, and you drove home on a whole point that we've moved from probably a, a, a rural, a pure rural community, the one that, that, that began to become more suburban and more dense. And can you validate for us as the 13th largest county, aren't we probably the most eighth most dense 
in the state. And this concentrates. So how are you, how does this plan deal with, and, and to Madam Guyer's point earlier, I mean, as you plan, are you, are you taking into consideration transportation and flow? Because while I appreciate um, buildings and vertical, it's mobility is key. Mobility begets economic development. Can you speak on that, Allison, just a little bit? How this yeah. study, how these efforts will help? And that was a softball law, but I know you can do this. So <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, and, and I think, you know, um, in response to that comment, one of the things I want to make sure that we're kind of looping in our, our colleagues in transportation, we do understand that there has been a, a project on the books uh, to widen um, US 78. Um, it's been there for a number of years. Uh, my understanding is that it is still um, in long range and it still doesn't have an identified funding source. So to your point about um, mobility infrastructure, uh, that is absolutely key to a corridor like US 78. Um, you'll notice one of the things that we had identified in our timeline was that whole notion of infrastructure, right? The last time we saw a lot of improvements really coming in in the infrastructure space was between the 30s and the 70s, you know? And so I think that while we want to be cognizant that we have some long range projects in the books, um, I, I would say that we need to probably have a candid conversation about how long we want to wait for those projects to materialize before we start you know, kind of coming back down to the ground level and figuring out what are some of those, you know, incremental things that we can do to increase quality of life. Um, I'm going to pause right there and see if that's kind of getting at the um, at the at the answer that you were, you know, anticipating for that. Because I also kind of heard you raise some issues about density, which I'm happy to kind of um, allude to as well. Um, but yeah. I think that would be my key takeaway about mobility is that y'all discussed in the previous conversation about the SPLOST, a lot of these mobility projects come with big price tags. And I would just kind of respectfully suggest that that we could still move ahead with some some good sort of placemaking and some good context sensitive design while we're waiting for the resources to align for infrastructure improvements. All right. So then uh, my last point to your point, I know we have a comp comprehensive transportation plan that's in play. Miguel, we'll bring this up tomorrow during our transportation committee. So I, I guess I'm making sure that I, I, I try to avoid silos. You got planning zones over here and they've got their priority. You got transportation over here and they're doing their thing. I'm like, okay, are y'all talking? Are y'all lining this up? Now I get sometimes we move like, look, while they're working on this, let's work on our little study and our little plan and our little resource. Like, okay, but who's sitting up there aligning this? I'm, I'm trusting that the county administrator, you guys are watching this. And so it, it's more of a, all right, so are we saying that this is now a priority? Now it could be a sub priority. Now, I hear Chapel Hill is important. I hear Highway 5 is important. Uh, I hear Thornton and Lee Road are important. So now I'm hearing veterans, which I know is important. Uh, and to your point, I think it's, it's one of those we learned um, during the 2000s, during the Great Recession, is that we should do studies. We should do research while we're waiting for the big money to come. But I'm, I, I'm hearing that we're actually focusing on this as a priority. And I, I just, perhaps, Commissioner Mitchell, if you've got any comments that you still out there, I, I'd be willing to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because I have no problem if this is really an ask. I mean, it sounds like it's an update, but it sounds like at least a, uh, an acquiesce, a concurrence to keep moving. So I have no objections to what I'm hearing as far as study is concerned, but I'm, I'm looking for my peers way in like, okay, so what are we looking at here? So I heard um, um, Madam Chair and Commissioner Mitchell were, help, were instrumental in framing this coming before us. So can either one of y'all help understand what this is about? I yield the floor, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, so, thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell, can you chime in? This is your district, and then I'll just piggyback off of you. Well, I, I don't have much to say, Madam Chair, because we've had a nice long conversation. <laughs> we've had a nice long conversation, and the conversation was just as simple as understanding kind of where we are, where we want to go. We want to manage expectations and how great this corridor is and mm -hmm. how we can improve on this corridor and and take the smaller bites because the state got an idea of how this corridor should look, what we're going to be doing in 5, 10, 20 years, and it'd probably be longer. So we, we had a, our conversation, which was great as to where this corridor, what it, not only what it could be, what we're going to make it, but the direction we're going to take and why. So I, I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But um, we... we I, they've explained and we, we we adjusted even this presentation just to make sure kind of what it, what we should actually be talking about. So, and we know we got a couple other people that we need to get engaged in this conversation. Yes. Um, 
uh, I mean, a couple of organizations that need to be a part of this conversation to include homeowners and and or um, the business owners in that corridor to include. We talked about the uh, opportunity zone. So we, there's a lot in this, Madam Chair, that precede even your time frame as to what's in here that we haven't even had a chance to discuss, but we did. So I'll leave it at that, and, and I'll let my, my peers kind of chime in where they want to chime in. So I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, certainly, I, I, I echo Commissioner Mitchell again. This is an area, a corridor that has a lot of opportunity and it has a, a chance to flourish. I know we, uh, when I spoke with you, Allison, you know, you showed me both you and Ron some information from the 90s. I said, boy, this has been on the books way too long. If not, nothing else, we could just start just uh, romancing the idea of what it could look like in the future. Not saying that it's a priority, it is, but it is certainly something that's uh, much needed. Uh, and certainly just by working with these organizations, it doesn't sound like it's going to cost us anything for you all to get started, you know, based on some of the things. So it's it's not a it's, it's cost free. So I, I, I agree this it, it's time to start looking and, and the presentation was well done. And um, Board of Commissioners, do you have any other comments for them or Ron and Allison? Do you have anything else to add, Ron or Allison? Uh, no, ma'am. Just uh, really appreciate y'all's time today, and uh, um, you know we look forward to uh, to uh, beginning that dialogue, and we will be reaching out to uh, the commissioners along this corridor that you know that affect this, so that we can find some stakeholders and have some discussions with the people that you guys identify. Okay, thank you. We look uh, forward to another update when you all pull some more information together. Thank you so much, Allison, and thank you so much, Ron. Appreciate Thank your you. presentation. All right, Board of Commissioners, we're going to move on to tab number six. I've already uh, mentioned the approval of the minutes for tomorrow. Public hearing, we have a public hearing regarding the millage rate. Uh, certainly Sabrina Cogborn, who's our uh, Assistant Director of Finance, will present as well as our County Administrator, Mark Till, at the public hearing. We're going to move on to tab number seven. We have grants. Authorization to submit a fiscal year uh, 2020 Edwin Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant JAG application in the amount of $13,414. No match is allowed and allow for a 30 day public comment period and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director King, how you doing this morning, Jennifer? You, you're still on mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. There you go. Good morning. Um, this is a grant that we apply for and that we've had for a few years. Um, this is the only one in our normal course of business that requires the 30-day um, period for public comment. Board of Commissioners, any questions for Ms. King, our director? All right. Sounds Pretty self-explanatory. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to tab number eight, authorization to approve, and it's a business item, and we're going to move to tab number eight, authorization to approve $200,000 of CARES Act funding for the Elevate Douglas COVID-19 business grant. We have our uh, executive director of uh, economic development, Chris Pumphrey. Chris, you have the floor. Good morning. Can everybody Can't hear you. Yes. Go. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. Um, we talked to you all a few months uh, ago about the uh, COVID-19, the Elevate Douglas COVID-19 grant program, and we have named it now the Elevate Douglas COVID-19 uh, business grant fund. Um, and so this is a part of our partnership um, in creating the nonprofit uh, organization for economic development. So we are almost just about ready to go um, with the uh, with the program. I am going to share this real quick. And I will be brief here. Can everyone see this? Is this visible to everyone? 
No, yet. not yet, Chris. Yeah. <clears throat> Still nothing. Mm, no. Okay. Well, I'll just I'll I'll back out and I'll just talk through it. Um, we've uh, been working very diligently with the chamber, um, Google, um, and Switch um, in pulling all of this together. Um, the purpose of the grant fund, as we mentioned before, is to provide financial support to Douglas County businesses resulting. I mean, who've been financially impacted from the uh, COVID-19 uh, global health pandemic. We will be providing small business grants up to uh, $10,000, <clears> which is kind of different than what we just what we discussed before um, as we've worked through some more of the details and trying to make sure we magnify and optimize um, the opportunity that we have. Um, the grant is set to be launched on August the 24th. Um, that's next week, Monday, and um, we have set up a, a small business review committee that consists of two members of the Development Authority Board, two members uh, of the Chamber Board, and um, myself and Sarah kind of serving as the, the staff uh, liaisons to the group. Breezy Straighten will be working on kind of the logistics of the, of the platform. We have uh, a website that will go live uh, later today. It is a website uh, specifically set to support um, all the businesses. This is where they will um, they will get the application uh, for the grant program itself, um, and they'll be able to get all of the you know the eligibility requirements, um, everything that they need to know about the program. Um, that program website um, is Douglas County. Um, one second. Um, is douglascountysmallbusiness.com. Um, douglascountysmallbusiness.com. We'll make sure we send that to you all. Like I said, it should go live later today. If you try and access it right now, you probably will get um, the, uh, you're, you're probably directed to the Chamber website, but this will be a standalone uh, website and you'll see the Elevate Douglas Economic Partnership COVID-19 Business Relief Grant Fund. On that website, as I mentioned, that's where the individuals will, app will um, find the application. We have broken it down into tiers. So there will be uh, up to $2,000 for sole proprietors, uh, up to $5,000 for companies with employees of two to five, um, up to $7,500 for six to 10, and up to $10,000 for 11 to 25. On the website, we've got the eligible uses uh, of the funds. We're trying to ensure that everything um, is in compliance with CARES Act funding. Um, we know there are some um, specific requirements there, so we're ensuring that it's uh, meeting those needs, meet, meeting those requirements in the event that there is an audit, we can track and show where those, how those proceeds were used. The target of the proceeds will be towards, re, will be reimbursable funds. So we're not looking at what are future funds, because like I said, we're trying to make sure we adhere to CARES Act proceeds. Um, and that is for, we'll, we'll receive receipts uh, for those funds. Um, so we have the eligible uses, the eligibility requirements that are laid out there, similar to what you've already seen. They've got to have a valid business license from Douglas County, City of Douglasville, City of Villarica, or City of Austell, but all those, those other two cities within Douglas County. So the only for Douglas County businesses, um, they have to demonstrate an interruption as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's reflected in the documents that are required. Um, and then the, the list, there's about nine different require eligibility requirements uh, that you'll see there. And I apologize that I'm not able to show um, what I'm looking at right here on the website, but we'll make sure that you can access that. <clears throat> There'll be a certain number of documents that'll be uh, required of the businesses as well. And so we're making the website very clear um, what's needed and what are disqualifications um, that to where you cannot apply uh, for the funds. Um, we'll have a, a webinar that'll be that'll go live um, on Monday, which is the day that the um, application goes live itself. And that'll just be a walkthrough of everything on the application process. We are using a platform called Neighborly. Uh, Neighborly um, is really built for things like this. Um, the Invest Atlanta uses them for all of their uh, loan programs and grant programs. 
Um, Forsyth just started working with them. I know Cherokee is looking at working with them right now and a host of others. They're based out of Atlanta. Their platform is, like I said, is built for grant and loan funds. What it does is it allows us to track um, the sources of funds and tie them to specific entities and tie them specifically to what that um, what those funds went to cover. And so this will be our means of making sure that if you ever have to do an audit, that we have all that information readily handy. Um, Neighborly is built, is its platform sits on the Microsoft Azure um, uh, data centers and all of the information is secured in that data center. And so we've got, um, I guess the, the, the security built around that because we are collecting sensitive information. Um, that, um, let me make sure there's anything else I needed to cover. Um, we did send postcards out um, on Friday. We went to every um, licensed business in the community. So those postcards went out. Um, the digital uh, marketing will start this week, uh, making sure that it'll, it'll be on Facebook, all the social media platforms. We'll get it in Douglas County happenings as well. All the, the social media outlets via the city of Douglasville as well. We'll make sure that we're promoting this as much as we possibly can. Uh, those businesses should have started receiving those postcards, hopefully today. Um, we know how the mail system is. It's a little backed up right now, but we, we wanted to give them time that, you know, before the program launches. One change we did make is that it is not a first come first serve. It was a kind of a built in lottery system that we'll be using. That way, uh, businesses don't have to rush to try and get a, an application in on the first day. We want to make sure they have a very complete application. All the information is accurate. And then of the complete ac applications with all the required documentation, then they'll be pulled um, pulled from that uh, database and we'll start awarding from there. So I think that covers everything. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Executive Director Humphrey. Board of Commissioners, we have any questions for Chris Humphrey? Comments? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Vice Chairman Robson, you have the floor. All right. All right. So, uh, th th thank you, Chris, for for the, the presentation. Please give us a copy of that. You know, we 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 we're you, the only thing with this whole Zoom world is that you know <laughs> we're we're used to paper still. Papyrus is still important to conducting business. So I mean, you get it. Send it to us when you can, please, mm -hmm. uh, so we can have that. All right. So let me make sure I and really I'm I'm being reflective of my peers. So let's see, elevate versus empower. Let me, let me make sure I get this right. So now the chamber is wanting us to um, um, support an initiative that I get it. You guys know I get it, but I don't forget. Um, make sure I get this right. So a program that will support the community. Chris, ask me, answer this question. What's the difference between the city of Douglasville and Douglas County? How do you separate the two in if I'm putting in, let's say, 200000 how do I ensure that that amount of money goes to my constituents in unincorporated? I mean, how, how will you balance that? And then one of the things that we've always we struggle with is economic development that concentrates in one area versus another, right? How, how will you ensure a relative spread? I'm not looking for absolute, but how do we ensure this money and this committee is not concentrated in certain areas? Start with that question. How do you how do you avoid that? So part of the <clears throat> the, the the beauty of the, the neighborly platform is it allows us to dive down um, deeply into the questions that we ask and how we pull um, pull information. So when an applicant goes in to apply, they will check a box. Did you apply for your business license in the city of Villarica, Austell, Douglas County, or Douglasville? And we can pull from that. We also have each source of funds separated um, and they're separated within the platform and so then we can go and we can run for city of douglasville businesses and apply <clears throat> city of douglasville funds to city of douglasville businesses so the, the 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 pools of funds you've got like i mentioned you have the development authority the chamber um switch and google so those are <clears throat> i guess the 
the ones that are broadly used for all, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to say that. You're right. <clears throat> I was snacking on popcorn, so <laughs> um, that all things, um, those funds are for any business within Douglas County. And so recognizing to try and make sure as best as possible that we target city of Douglasville funds and city of Douglasville businesses, Douglas County funds and Douglas County businesses. That's how we'll work on the separation of the two is by pulling based off of where their licenses are. All right. All right. I'm going to shift gears. Duly noted. That's just probably for the general public, for those who are paying attention. So if I say $200,000 divided by what? $10,000 is what? 20. Did, did I do the math right? Yeah. 20, 20 businesses. And that, that's all relative. That's at the top end. And I, I like I actually like your strata now. I, I, I think that you guys have come a little bit further along. I'm glad to hear the infrastructure you're using, neighborly. Well done. You're, you're moving along. You're, you're actually in a place where you're actually ready to do this versus a few months ago, there was nothing there. So I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you guys have moved along. Um, but still, 20 businesses. Uh, 20 businesses. In, in Madam Chair, I think at one time we said we've got, what, 4,000 unincorporated businesses. So it's it's all relative, right? I mean, it shows a good faith effort uh, that we're, we care, that we see people that are out there that are being impacted, those small businesses. But, but one of the things that I did ask for, and I think um, Director Tiffany Store Stanley, uh, I think she did, no, I don't think, she delivered to me what I asked for is, tell me the number of businesses that were impacted by PPP, the number of businesses within Douglas County that actually got grant um, grant awards. And I've got a copy of that. And my peers should have gotten a copy of that. They didn't, they will make sure they get a copy. But that is something that I asked specifically. And hopefully, Chris, you've taken a look at that. And it's typically the, the normal who's who, I mean, this is public record, but it's the normal who's who of Douglas County that gets it's just a normal who's who. And so our, um, for the people who really have a need out there that, that 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 may not be part of our mailing list, who who are not in our immediate circle, but yet they, they've been here all along. And they, they may not just be as plugged in. They not may not come to the chamber meetings. And my, my concern is that this funding could potentially go to people who just, you know, they don't hang out with you. They may not, but that don't mean that they don't exist. And I've always had that problem, the normal, I just, it, it's like a who's who. It's like, you know, and I, how do we ensure the people who really need it get it? And I'm okay. You don't have to let let that go. But I think you see what my concern is. It's just, okay, guys, y'all have got this little committee that's going to award these $10,000 to these 20 people on behalf of Douglas County proper. And how do I know that it's just not friends of friends versus uh, people who may not even, you know, hey, look, I've been here all along and I didn't know to plug into that, but how do you ensure I, I at least get considered? It's okay. I'm going to let that go. It's more of a statement. And I'm going to close with this. And, and again, I'm messaging. Um, I still think that education is key here. And since we're, at, we're asking, and I'm, I've already made this known, my condition of support cannot be done without education. As opposed to awarding 20 people, I'd rather educate 4,000 business owners or, or, or perhaps um, you know, 20,000 aspiring business owners. Um, I, I think education is key, helping people understand business plans, uh, helping them um, that that's a proper use of the money uh, or at least a part of it. I know you guys are working on, we've got to, come up with a business plan or a plan to spend COVID money. You know, we said that this is part of it, but to just give, to, to give away fish, not teach people how to fish, runs contrary to what I believe in this one area. I, as you know, I've been a strong proponent of entrepreneurship, this one area, and to give them money without giving them an instruction behind that, or to either you can be in the game and you want to sort of re recalibrate or you like, look, I don't have a job, but I need to create a job. I need to create an opportunity. There's, where's the education behind this? And so for my support for this, you have to have uh, an overlay of um, an online education. 
Um, I, I think that's key. I mean, there's plenty of platforms that are out there that like, okay, guys, y'all may not get this grant, but you, here's a way in which you go pitch money. Here's a way to go raise money. Here's a way in which to get in the game. And so I think we fall short just by you know feeling good about ourselves that I gave somebody a plate. I, I just gave you a plate. Right? I gave you a grant. I, I don't think we're doing right by just giving away this grant. I, I think it falls short. So that being said, I'm going to let that go. Um, Chris, you if, go well, ahead. I would, I, I would certainly agree with you if 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 this was the only thing that we were doing, which it's it's not. This is just um, this is an opportunity for us to do to to fill a need and serve a need, a financial need that you know hundreds of businesses are being impacted by, um, and ensuring that the the proceeds are only going to Douglas County businesses and not going you know, to the broader um, national um, pool of, of businesses that are out there. So, in in, in the points that you made are, are definitely things that um, our committee has discussed. And so, just so that um, you know, you know, some of these are you know, individuals who you all have appointed, you know, to the Development Authority Board, um, and and are here representative of the community and have the, the community's best interest at hand. So um, one of the, the, the things that is kind of happening simultaneous to this is we started um, with our small business and entrepreneurial consultant Finding Next. Um, they started their work uh, last month um, with, the, with the goal of concluding um, their work uh, in October um, where they'll be making their presentations to the Development Authority Board and the Chamber Board. And so what their role is to do is to kind of create that pipeline, utilizing some of the things that you that you all have funded in the past with the uh, incubator study, taking all of the different pieces that go into building an entrepreneurial ecosystem in Douglas County. Uh, they're working on that for the companies that do not those that do and do not get awarded. Um, this gives us the opportunity to connect with those businesses in 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 present to them the full um, platform of, of resources that do exist. Um, so, you know, this this pandemic is, this has been something that's been in the works um, all along. We had already planned to bring on this small business mm -hmm. consultant. We actually started the, um, the development of the RFP back in January. Uh, and so, you know, we started, like I said, ahead of this, but this is not just, we're only doing this. This is an opportunity to ensure that we're providing all the resources that exist to Douglas County businesses. All right. Well, um, if this is an if this is a discussion or if this is an actual ask, my question is: Are you asking us to award two hundred thousand dollars tomorrow to this program? Yes or no? Yes, sir. All right. So if this is going to be on the agenda for tomorrow, mine is going to come with conditions uh, specific to um, obviously education. So that's we can work on that between now and tomorrow to be clear. If, if for my support, it, it has to be part of it. So um, just to clarify, um, and I yield the floor, Madam Chair. I'm good enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman. We have um, Commissioner Guider. I see your hand on the computer, Commissioner Guider. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Chris, uh, you said that we had four thousand unincorporated um, or somebody said it I don't know if you did uh, mm -hmm. uh, vendors uh, and one of the requirement is that they had to apply for a business license um, usually business license are paid by by now uh, should it not be people that have actually paid for a business license this year yeah, if, if I if if I when stating that it was, we're ma basically saying when you got your business license, you know which jurisdiction did you check, but the business would have to have been in business prior to um, the pandemic, so they would have to have been in business at least a year. So not necessarily like oh let me go apply to get in. They would have had to renew. Maybe that's the word I should say. They well, would have had to renew. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, their business license by now. <clears throat> what I'm saying, and uh, I kind of go along with uh, uh, Kelly, Ro Commissioner Robinson, that um, we want to make sure it gets to 
active businesses. Exactly. Uh, not not people that's already, you know, taken the shingle down and they've left. Um, you know, we sometimes we're quick to uh, just make uh, decisions like this. Uh, although this is uh, coming from the CARES Act, mm -hmm. that's from the federal government. Mm -hmm. It's still taxpayer money, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and we fund the taxpayers' money. Whether uh, I mean the uh, federal government, whether we like to uh, admit to it or not. But if it there's four thousand unincorporated um, vendors. What about the city of Douglasville, where most of the businesses are, the, the stores are? Yeah, I, I think the total number is around 7,000, um, 7,000, between seven and 7,500 businesses. So actually, the, you know, the, there's actually more in un, unincorporated Douglas than there are in the city of Douglasville. Um, so the, the okay. city, go ahead. I was going to ask, are you requiring to look at their bank statement or something to see that they have been working? Uh, yeah, um, so, so and the, what about the, the so, sole proprietors? Say uh, someone that does lawn work, okay? He's out there every day and he's getting paid for it. Is is he going to qualify for this grant? So the, el the eligibility requirements that you do have to have a valid business license in one of the four jurisdictions. Um, you have to demonstrate business interruption as a result of the pandemic. And so that shows in the required documents that, that, are, that need to be provided. So you have a completed W-9 form, tax ID and all of that, um, itemized summary of eligible expenses, um, a 2019 profit and loss statement and a 2020 profit and loss statement through June 30th. Um, and then the copy of, of the business license and um, the W-3 summary or IRS form 941 uh, prior to March 13th that shows the number of employees that they have. So there's documentation that they have to provide for that. Okay, and what about chain restaurants and stores? Are they eligible for this? you have to be a Douglas County based business. Now, if you happen to be a franchise owner based in Douglas County, then um, I believe um, that, that, that company is eligible. But if you are just a, 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 an owner that has 30 chains across you know, Atlanta, no, you would not be eligible. Okay, and uh, did you say whether or not they would have had to, they've got to have an active business license correct a, yeah, a valid, yeah a valid business a valid business license today and would have had to have been in business at least one year prior to the shelter in place okay well it just seems like uh if you're talking about seven thousand with douglasville and and douglas county and you're also including um villarica and uh, did you say all stale? I assume you mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Um, Both of those are going to be very small um, just because there's not, <laughs> there's only a handful of businesses coming from those. I know it, but uh, the, the payout is getting smaller too. So mm -hmm. will, it really, will it really benefit that many people in our businesses? Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that we definitely struggled with. You know, you know, if you look at, you know, Cobb County, they got a $50 million grant and, you know, they they had their their funds came in a different way. Um, the folks in Forsyth have $2 million um, that they're using um, from CARES Act funds. So everyone just kind of has different pools. So we're just trying to use what we have, um, you know, to, to make as much impact as we possibly can. Do I wish we had $2 million? Yes, but we don't. <laughs> so this this is uh, in the CARES Act, but it's specific just for this purpose. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> so, so what we have, so between Douglas County, what we're talking about for you all is $200,000. The city of Douglasville has already said, you know, talked about their $200,000 going in. So 400,000 would be CARES Act funds. And then 200,000 are non-CARES Act funds. Um, and those are funds, like, like I mentioned, from the Development Authority, Chamber, Google, and Switch. So um, 
is the city of Villarica or Austell, are they paying anything into it? I know, ma'am. But they're reaping. The businesses are going to reap from it, but they're not going to. The city's not contributed. Uh, no, ma'am. And Seems we, like we didn't that, <laughs> Seems like we're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul is is, is the only thing. Uh, but um, well, I guess that that answers most of my questions. But it, it just seems like it's uh, just a drop in the bucket. Now the uh, federal government, um, if if the house is, comes back in session, they've been on recess. Um, I don't know that. This this next uh, payout or uh, COVID payout is going to include any more uh, of the uh, PPC PPE PPP. Uh huh. Uh huh. Do you? Yeah, we, yeah, we n none of us knows, um, and I, I think that's kind of where you know we were I think where we were last time is like you know, what's going to happen you know on this next this next round and. Um, yeah, we, we don't, we have no idea <laughs> what, what's going to happen. Well, what if we do this and then the federal government comes down and does it again? So <laughs> should we go ahead without at least giving, um, since, uh, the house is being called back out of recess <laughs> and they've been asked to come back to Washington. Should we not wait on them to see what they're going to do? Like I said, you know, we, you, you very well could do that. Um, our goal is to still go forward and launch on the 24th. Um, and we'll launch with the 200,000 that we have today. Um, I believe the city of Douglasville is, uh, has committed their 200,000. Um, and we're making sure that we are uh, acting accordingly with the CARES Act, um, um, the use of funds from the CARES Act. Uh, and so we're, we'll, we'll um, act prior, um, appropriately with that. They haven't received their funds, so it might be like a round two that actually happens. Um, but we're going to proceed with the 200000 that we have today, starting on Monday. Okay, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. If there's nothing else from the board, I'm going to move on. We're a little tight on time. I'll see you, Commissioner Carthen. You popped up. There you are, Commissioner Carthen. We can't, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. You okay? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me, Chris? Yes. Okay. I, for some reason, we couldn't hear Commissioner Carthen. Let me see if she's okay. Commissioner Carthen, are you there? I believe you told me to move on. If if I can always come back to it. All right, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation this morning. I'm going to move on to tab number nine, authorization to approve a contract with West Publishing Corporation for the purchase of the West Law Research and Software in the annual amount of $2,457 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Valerie Gordon, are you here? Attorney Gordon, are you on the... Mark, do you want to take this for Attorney Gord Gordon? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was on a different page. So, uh, Miss Gordon has, uh, so it's sort of like LexisNexis. So, all the judges have this software to look up uh, court cases, things of that nature, and they don't have any more open positions on their license. So this is a new license for juvenile uh, court, juvenile public defender. Okay. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay. We're going to move on to the next item. We have the Lexus Nexus is pretty popular. It uh, gives uh, it's certainly a large uh, a landscape of information for, um, for our elected officials and uh, the tax commission as well. We're going to move on to tab number 10. 
authorization to approve a right-of-way easement for Greystone Power Corporation in order to run power to the new concession stand at Bill Arp as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee and authorize the chairman to sign all, all related documents. Director Gary Dix, good morning. Good morning, good afternoon. everyone. Good, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, you said it, uh, Madam Chair, it's just to allow Greystone the right-of-way so they can run power to our new uh, concession restaurant building at Bill Arp Park. Pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Thank you so much, Board. If we don't have any questions um, or comments, we're going to move on to the next tab. The next tab is number 11, authorization to approve a right-of-way easement for Georgia Power in order to run an underground line to set the needed transformer for the new senior center as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Duke? Yes, ma'am. Uh, once again, this is for Georgia Power to run power to our new Lithia Springs Senior Center. Okay. Any questions from the board? Sounds pretty self-explanatory, and thank you for moving these projects along, Director. Thank you. Thank All you. right, we're going to move on to tab number 12, a recommendation of a new senior center name. Dr. Gilchrist, good morning. A good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Commissioner, and citizens. As you can see, based on the SWAS update, much progress has been made on the new senior center. We are excited at that progress and twice as enthusiastic um, about its completion and look forward to the day when we can take full advantage of all it has to offer. So we are looking forward to that. In anticipation of the opening in June 2020, a stakeholders committee consisting of nine community members was formed to provide suggestions regarding programming, design, and valuable insight from an older adult perspective for the new senior center. During their July 21st, 2020 meeting, there was open discussion about naming of the new center. Stakeholders were provided an opportunity to provide their recommendations and suggestions. Those suggestions were presented to members of the Park and Recreation Committee, and I'm going to try to share my screen let's see here let's see it says my screen sharing is disabled so um recommendations for the new senior center we have three names that were brought forth those names are south Sweetwater Senior Activity Center, Lithia Springs Senior Center, and Sweetwater Active Center for Seniors. So <clears throat> those are the three most favorable names for the board's consideration. That's, that's, that's it. Would you like me to repeat those, Madam Chair, or? Yeah, you can once again for the board and then we will. Okay, South Sweetwater Senior Activity Center, Lithia Springs Senior Center, and Sweetwater Active Center for Seniors. Okay, Board of Commissioners, do you have any comment or anything you would like to add to the discussion or do you have any, any um, suggestions or would like to determine which one we would like to move forward with in terms of the name. And I certainly want to yield to uh, Commissioner Mitchell of District uh, 1, and also he is the he is the chairman of the Parks and Recreation Committee. Um, chairman of Parks and Recreation Committee, uh, Commissioner Mitchell, I ask that you lead off and kind of give us an idea of what you, your thoughts are. Well, Dr. Gilchrist, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Gilchrist has made a great presentation, has made the uh, uh, basically the recommendation based on the uh, names that she went from uh, the first name to the third uh, name. And I think the first name is actually what we're actually recommending from the uh, Parks and Rec Committee. Uh, outside of that, I mean, it's just, it's a name. And I, I don't think, it, I think the name that uh, being stated, and Dr. Gilchrist, could you give me that name once again so we can kind of hear it for the, for the record, that the, the first name, not the other, not the other two. The first name is South Sweetwater Senior Activity Center. Right, and that would be the one that I would like to see us move forward with. But again, 
I uh, will yield to the co-chair of the Parks and Rec Committee and also to um, the, this board to decide on if that's the name we'd like to move forward. But we need to kind of move it because um, from my understanding, Mark, you might want to verify this, but I think we need to kind of move on this because we need to start we're at that stage where we need to place something in writing on the building itself and start moving with the building being named as such so we can move forward with all that, correct? Yes, sir. We've got the, the sign that goes in front of the building that is uh, pending this name and the uh, plaque inside. That's correct. So with that being stated, so we can kind of stay on course and get this thing up and running, which we're kind of moving a lot faster than we anticipated. So I think we're ready to move forward with that. But that, uh, as stated, that will be the name that we will recommend. Outside of that, I'll yield the floor to my colleagues. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Um, Board of Commissioners, anyone else have any comments? Uh, I, I concur with the name, and I'll just add my two cents. I concur with the name that has already been brought forth. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, you, would you please chime in so we can move on to yeah. the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, obviously I'm going to yield to whatever uh, a, a stakeholder committee wants that area to be. I mean, obviously I'm quite sure that uh, my citizens weighed in. So if that's what's come up through the committee and that's what's being presented, um, I'm just going to leave it at that and say, as long as they're pleased, I'm pleased. So I yield. That's okay, fine. thank you. Vice Chairman of the Parks and Recreation Committee, Commissioner Carthen, do you have any input? I think she's still having issues with being connected. I, I don't oh. see her on. Okay. Again, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I see Mark. Is she, is she on? I don't think she is. I don't see her. Okay. Uh, you know, I want just want to check just to verify, but no, I think she's having some connectivity issues. So, okay, maybe she'll be on in a second. District Four Commissioner uh, Ann Jones Do you have any input or concurrence? Uh, well, I I preferred the Lithia Springs because that tells everybody exactly where it is. So, <laughs> but uh, I'll go along. It's not my district, so. Okay. Well, our, I think our other center is Woody Fife, so it definitely does not tell anyone where it is. So I believe this is probably what this this name is what the stakeholders wanted. So uh, well, it was I, one of them. It was yeah. there was three names submitted, and that's why I said Lithia Springs. Yeah, Lithia Springs. Okay. Yeah. Initially, when it was brought forth to me, commissioners, well, I said Lithia Springs. You know, prior to this, but uh, certainly after listening to. What the stakeholders agreed upon. I just said I concur. Sweetwater. I mean, South, South Sweetwater. I want to make sure I'm saying. See, it you already yes, got it wrong. It's a tongue <laughs> but I'm kidding. <laughs> you already got it wrong. If you said Lithia Springs, everybody know what you're talking about. <laughs> I yield back. Okay, okay, thank chair. you so much, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Mitchell, like, our chairman yeah. of the Parks and Recreation. Commission. As you notice, know, I hope you guys understand South Sweetwater has a, has a, a meaningful name. Of location if you're looking for the location now i just know that we are used to saying lithia springs because that's kind of how we initiated this that was the whole uh, uh initiation of lithia springs as we went through the building process but south sweetwater uh dr gill fancy correct me if i'm wrong that has significance to it based on the location as well correct correct yes sir yeah so so that, that is a location but it's just that i i get Commissioner Guider, you're used to saying Lithia Springs because Lithia Springs is where it is. It is actually in Lithia Springs, absolutely. But it is a part of the South Sweetwater layout. So same difference, it's just a play on words. However, this is kind of what the committee and the committee decided on upon, you know, even though it went through the stakeholders and everybody else. But I think the name, uh, what we got, I think it's gonna be a great name and I think we'll, we'll be proud of it in the end, so. I'll leave it at that. Thank you again, Dr. Gilchrist, for a job well done. Uh, and we got a lot more work to do, though, because we, we, you know, the stakeholders got a lot more work to do to kind of continue this thing because we're on the programming side of it. And uh, I think, you know, we, we, we're doing a great job at that. So uh, outside of that, I'll yield. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, uh, both Commissioner uh, Mitchell and also Commissioner Guider. Um, with that being said, clerk, please make sure you uh, make sure you obtain the correct name from uh, Dr. Gilcrest, and then we will make sure that it's uh, legitimate tomorrow on our, if it rolls into the consent agenda, or even if it's a new business item, I, I, I would love to see it as a consent agenda item. So 
I hope you have it, Brooke. All right. Ch we'll Chairman move on. Jones. Chairman oh, Jones. there you are. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much for bearing with me. Uh, may I obtain the floor for a second? Yes, you may. Thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, I was wondering if Dr. Gilchrist could have given us the actual account of votes for the for the names. Did she have that with her? And and I'll and I'll chime in there for you though. Just I apologize. We we decided to based on everything that we kind of sent out in the timeline, what we did, um, the numbers were so so small to where it what it didn't kind of come through as we thought it would because we didn't get the response time that we had and we didn't have the time frame based on what we're dealing with uh, Commissioner Harp. And so we decided to kind of stay away from that and just come up with the, the, the layout based on the, the committee and everybody else. So, so, so my question in that would be, uh, what is the time frame? And Commissioner Mitchell, you may not know this, but uh, for our county administrator, what is the time frame in order to get a plaque or a name um, for the center done? What would be the time frame in getting that signage up? So, Commissioner Carson, we're ready to proceed on both of those. We have both of them on hold. So the contractor is ready to start the uh, the sign, and James is ready to order the plaque. What would be the time frame? What is the initial time frame? Is it 30 days? Is it 45 days? Is it 72 hours? Once we say this is the name, what is the time frame? Is my question. Oh, um, as far as the sign goes, I do not know. They'll have to fabricate it, but we've got to have the name before we can order the sign. The plaque usually takes a couple weeks. A couple of weeks. Okay. So my question is, if it's between South Sweet Water and Lithia Springs, why can't we do a quick celebrate Douglas or a quick, uh, I think it's Douglas happenings on the Facebook page. I always get that confused to allow for the citizens who are actually going to fund this. I mean, although this is floss dollars, the citizens will actually be funding the programming and everything else that will make up uh, uh, this this center. So why can't we put it for a vote for the citizens for the next 24 hours? Will that time frame prohibit us from still moving in a timely manner? Okay, Madam Chair, let me, can I chime in on that one? Yes, yes, yeah. uh, Commissioner Mitchell. I, I know Commissioner Carpenter has the floor, but I just want to make sure she's okay with you chiming in. I am, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Madam I mean, Commissioner Carpenter. But here, here's where we are. Because of, I think you were at the last meeting, because of the time, the timing of this, we were already uh, behind the gun of actually having a name, which we should have had it before our last meeting. So that time frame was kind of lapsed based on the mere fact of, the time frame we gave Dr. Gilchrist to try to move this through so we can kind of at least get to a consensus of a name. So I, I think based on my conversations with not only Mark, the contractors and others, we should have had something on the books probably several months ago to have to keep them moving forward. However, the citizens and, and others did have a chance in actually having some input in this. Uh, that's why we ended up where we are. So now we didn't do the whole celebrate Douglas. No, we didn't. However, um, I think based on timing and Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think the, the signage is kind of on hold, but I think if we decide to wait to another meeting, we'll be off keel to try to have a vote and then come back with the, the, the signage, you know, even using those two names that Commissioner Carson mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll be way off and probably be behind the eight ball even further, correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Actually, the contractor is ready to start now, so right. he's on hold. So, Commissioner Carson, I, I understand your concern. I mean, I think it would have been an ideal layout, but I think due to time and timing, um, I think we had to make a decision even at our last meeting that I pushed Dr. Gilchrist to have me something back, or at least the committee back by, I want to say the 11th, but don't quote me on these dates as to why we had to have it ready for this meeting and have a decision made by this meeting so these guys won't 
you know, we won't, you know, slow this thing down based on a name and anything else. So, Commissioner Parkins. I, I hear your explanation. I, again, will stand where I am in that you should put it out there for people to vote on and it can still be an agenda item. We do meet within the next week. Uh, and if you if you put it out there right now, uh, Director Teal, for people to vote and close it down, or not you, Director Teal, but the communications team in general, if we put it out there now for the community to vote, you still will get it back in time enough for us to put it on the consent agenda. If we put it out there for the next four hours, if we put it out there for, you know, until six o'clock this afternoon, you still can get a consensus from the others within the community. So I don't think it's that hard pressed that we can't put it out there to get a general consensus since it was those two names um, and no one could really come to, even even the focus group or the, the uh, committee that we had couldn't come to a hard decision. But you. that's where I am. Okay, I so, so thank you. So, so, so Mark, we that that's not a problem. I, I don't think that's not a that's not a bad idea. But I, I think what's going to happen though is this, Mark. If we can get uh, Rick to pull this off in this kind of a time frame, but I think on the agenda, um, by the end of the day, for sure, we need to probably have a decision made that way, so the consent agenda will reflect the name. So. I don't have a problem with that. I, I think that's okay if, if that's what she's speaking of, of actually, you know, trying to put something out there for a quick minute to see what kind of response we'll get. Mark, I just don't know Rick's timing to pull off something like that to, to see what yeah, kind of we response can, we'll get. You know, we can so, get that out there and we can actually do it until tomorrow and just put this on his new business or old business tomorrow. No, Mark. Whichever category that falls in and then add the name at that point. No, no, let's let's put it on the consent agenda as we, we're planning to do so. And hopefully by the end of today, we will hopefully have some kind of a feedback that will respect uh, Commissioner Carthen's uh, ideals. And, and hopefully by then, and we'll, we'll hold up, you know, by the end of today. So that way tomorrow, the consent agenda will reflect the actual name based on the end of today. Okay? Okay. Right. Okay, thank you, Byron. And thank you, Commissioner Carson. I, I get your point. We, we can do that. Wait, I, Madam Chair? Yes. Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, let me. All right, let me let me make sure I get this right. So did 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 the we were presented with three options, so I heard. Am I being told that I can't vote on one of them? And that we're going to go into what's being expressed. What, what did I just hear? Because I mean, right. is it more? Is it more you're asking me to vote on something? Or are we waiting for the influence? I, I, I'm just curious. Again, I'm a bystander on this, but I, I, I gotta. I can't let my voice go away. So, am I being presented by staff? Staff presented something to us to the board of commissioners. That was a presentation. I heard three options. What I'm hearing, the collusion that there really isn't three options. There's really what 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 the committee is saying. I'm like, well, which one is it? Don't present three options for me to vote on if, in fact, we're being told this is sort of what we're going with. Which I'm okay, but this, you know, you know how I am about that. Like, let's be clear. Now I'm also hearing that we want to go forth to the broader community. Now, that's fine. I, I just want to keep this honest. When we come in tomorrow, that we're clear. We don't have to vote. We don't have to respond to me. Uh, I'm just what I just heard was, well, which one is it? Um, but I, I get where y'all are going. I'm, and again, this is not my committee. But so tomorrow, to your point, Commissioner Mitchell, let's be very clear. And if it's in the consent agenda, let it be done. I don't want to have a debate uh, or you know taking positions within consent agenda. So let's just be clear. I ask. I yield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Carlton, and also Commissioner Mitchell. Um, certainly, it, it sounds like uh, Commissioner Mitchell has given a directive to the Communications Department to uh, move forward with the, I call it a poll, to determine which one. And Commissioner Mitchell, you want all three names listed as the ones that no. Commissioner, I mean, that uh, no. Dr. Gilchrist read off? No, only the Nephew Springs and the uh, South Sweetwater uh, Senior Activity Center. So, okay. And, okay. And by the end of the day, 
me and Mark will kind of huddle up and tell you guys what the end results are. And that way, he'll know from that perspective with Lisa what name to put on the consent agenda for this particular layout. And hopefully, hopefully that will clear up uh, Commissioner. If you asked somebody to do something and they didn't do it, you'd have a fit. Turn you. Oh, yeah, I don't want him to see me, me, so I'm like, what? Hello? Oh, you need to turn the phone off. Okay. Showing my video. I don't want him to see me. Like, I got the video canceled out, so why is it showing my face? We need someone to mute, please. Mute, mute your, yes. Thank you. Hold on. Hey, hey, TJ, mute everybody and let everybody unmute themselves. There you go. Oh, you don't. Mark, who has that control? There we go. They're muted. I, I think they're, they're muted. muted now. They're muted now. Okay, cool. So, Madam Chair, back to back to the initial conversation, so that we can uh, get a clear get a clear understanding on what's going to happen tomorrow. Mark and I will huddle up today at the end of the day, and Lisa will put on the agenda out of the two names on the poll that we'll put up today, and we'll determine what that name will be based on the poll that we get today. It will either be Lithia Springs and or not and or or South Sweetwater. Uh, Senior Activity Center, so, and that will, and, and Lisa, do you kind of get what we're saying, what we're doing, basically? So you'll get the final results and tell them what that is, and that's what we'll contently vote upon tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, sir, I understand. Okay. Okay. All right. And the agenda go. The agenda goes out about four o'clock today, so that would be the deadline. Sounds good. And we'll, and we'll have something marked today by four o'clock for Lisa. Okay. I yield. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We're going to move on board. We pressed a little bit for time. Let's move on to uh, tab number 13, authorization to advertise for a public hearing to consider amending the Douglas County Code of Ordinances, ordinances to adjust package retail Sunday alcohol sales of malt be beverages and wine to begin 11 a.m. and end at 12 midnight, pursuant to the uh, House Bill 879 which will go into law on August 3rd, 2020. Um, Manager Roberts, Ron Roberts. Uh, hello again, Commissioner, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Yes, it's item is as written. Uh, House Bill 879 has passed August 3rd. Uh, we would like to uh, work with uh, Lisa Watson and, and uh, uh, the staff to uh, put a public hearing, um, amend by um, ordinance amendment process uh the uh, 11 a.m to 12 midnight for the sale of retailers of malt beverages and wine uh for douglas county so this would be uh an item that we would want to change our ordinance for and uh, go through that process so that's the ask right now okay any questions from the board if not i'm gonna move on all right thank you so much um ron Tab number 14 is authorization to amend participant contributions from for the ACCG Retirement Services Defined Benefit Plan and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Perry, I think we just visited this last week. You must have you having a correction or a uh, no, no, no correction. Uh, I'm just working with uh, ACCG Retirement Services to get the necessary paperwork. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and to the Board of Commissioners, to our citizens. Uh, this is a fairly routine and common uh, modification that's made to the master plan document. We have the authority uh, or you all have the authority as the board to uh, change that contribution rate uh, as you see fit. So um, all I would need is just uh, the exact uh, percentage that you would like. And uh, you know I've been given that amount. So we're just waiting on paperwork now. And once we receive that, uh, we'll, we'll forward that to you. We don't have to wait until the paperwork comes in to make that adjustment, we would just let them know uh, uh, what to uh, what date it will become effective on, and then uh, then we can move forward. Okay, thank you so much, board or commissioners. Any comment, Commissioner Guider? Commissioner Guider? Yes, I'm sorry, I had to push out my butt. I'm sorry, um, Frederick. Uh, this is for the employees, right? Yes, ma'am. For everybody that is under the retirement, uh, the defined benefit plan. Yes, ma'am. Um, and this is, what is the rate? I'm, I'm sorry. 
the the current rate uh, contribution for full time employees is five percent. And you, we're talking about raising it up to what? Eight percent. Okay, so that is a three percent um, increase. Increase in contribution, but three percent um, reduction in their pay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, do you have any figures out there as to how how this is going to affect the employees um, dollar wise? We know well, percentage uh, wise. Percentage wise, well, that would be a three percent um, uh, reduction of their base salary. Uh, I could find that amount uh, out for you, Commissioner. What uh, what that would mean as far in terms of our overall payroll, but that would be a three percent uh, decrease to their take home pay. Uh, would you please uh, talk about the deficit that we always have every year for the defined benefit plan, and also any plans to get away from it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it probably I thought be something was going to come down from the benefits committee. Uh, I remember somebody saying we got some good news coming down from the benefit committee. Is this the good news? <laughs> well, uh, no, it's not the it's not the good news. Um, we uh, actually have a benefits committee meeting scheduled for uh, for Wednesday of this uh, of this week. Um, so we haven't had an opportunity to uh, to to look over this uh, proposed increase. Uh, the deficit uh, it probably would be better for the finance department to comment on the deficit to give you some uh, exact figures. But this will uh, we you know the retirement plan is one of our more expensive uh, benefits that we provide for our employees, uh, and this will help offset some of the costs that we've uh, we've incurred over the years. This hasn't changed, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, since uh, possibly 2009, 2010. Uh, uh, the the percentage went from three percent to five percent uh, back then. So uh, this has this remained at five percent for uh, a number of years. Well, uh, it's uh, just going to hit all the employees. Uh, you know, on the surface, it sounds right. But then again, when we're also talking about furloughs on top of it, it doesn't sound too good to me. Uh, and I, I thought, uh, of course, anybody in the um, retirement plan should be paying enough to, you know, uh, even it out to where the county's not picking up everything. But um, is there any plans to get away? Everybody has done away with the defined benefit plans. Mm -hmm. uh, the 401k, uh, a lot of people are going to that uh, when you come on board. for. Now, we can't change it for the people already there. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about future. Have y'all talked about... Um, changing it over like the state of Georgia did several years back. They changed it over to where they got away from their retirement plan over to a 401k. So everybody's paying uh, what they want. Uh, are they, they're paying a certain percentage as they come in and they know that. Um, this, this is something, this is a hard hit for our employees with the on top of furloughs mm -hmm. i think uh they were we were, somebody was talking about 10 furlough days next year this, this is hard hit uh three percent and then the furloughs too um and we haven't really talked about does it apply to uh, public safety or not so um as far as the furloughs go but mm -hmm. um is there any way to tier this um, maybe add one percent or one and a half percent, and 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 then maybe look at it next year and see. Um, I know that our um, we're going to have a lot of people retire. 
Mm -hmm. because of the sunset law in 21, not law, but rule. <laughs> uh, in, in 2021, we just heard that our fire chief was going to retire this year. Um, so um, we need a plan going forward because we're just digging our hole big, bigger is what mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking. And we, we need to have uh, a different, we need to go with what is out there that's more um, friendly, both to the, uh, the uh, employee and the employer. But um, I hate to hit them with something this big. This yeah. is 3% and then furlough days. So yeah. um, I think we need to think about this one. Okay. I'd like to uh, maybe uh, watch your committee meeting tomorrow and okay. see what you said and everything. But uh, that's going to be after. No, it's not. We have our night meeting, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like this uh, move from the consent agenda and put on uh, as uh, just a, a new item to separately business. Um, this is going to hurt our employees tremendously. And the, and the ones that are living in Douglas County, they may get a big tax increase. <laughs> so they're getting a triple whammy. So uh, um, I'd like to see it removed and, and put a little bit more thought if we can ease into uh, something. But we need a plan going forward. We need to get away from this uh, defined benefit plan. No one has them these days. So we need to get away from them. And with that, I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Yes. Certainly, as the chairman of the Defined Benefits uh, uh, Plan and Program, I certainly welcome you to come to our meeting tomorrow. In fact, this was your suggestion about increasing the pensions, but we're not, you know, the contribution. However, we're not looking at 2020. Uh, Mark and I have been in discussions. We're not doing anything for 2020. We're looking at for 2021, the 3%. Uh, Mark, uh, I had some conversations with him this past weekend, and he assured me that it's 2021, so the employees will not get a double hit. And also, it was your suggestion to look at those, and I've just certainly took everyone's suggestions under consideration. And again, it's been since 2010. And the fine benefit uh, program, before we scrap it, I don't plan to do that. We're looking at changing vesting. Vesting uh, is five years in this organization. Places that are sustainable are looking at, they have 10 years vesting. So we're going to be discussing that as well tomorrow for 2021. Anyone, it'll be after anyone who start uh, January 2021, of course, vesting would be 10 years. So that'll take some of the pressure off this, uh, this benefit, defined benefit plan. But of course, we're not looking at anything for 2020. Mark, am I correct? That's what you shared with me yesterday. Is that correct? No, I was under the impression that we were starting this now, but we can start it January 2021. Yeah, I think that's what now, we my were point was that we won't. This will not help 2020 numbers. It will help 2021 numbers. Right. As far okay. as the defined benefit pension is concerned. Okay. Nice. But that's up to the but board. The we can start January the furloughs, 1st. The furloughs start immediately, or what? Uh, it's the furloughs are not start this year, but next year. Yeah, they start. No, they start immediately. It's just five, it's five furlough days for right now. Okay. So we, we, I, we, I know I suggest. We can't have furlough. our cake and eat it too. You're saying don't raise the uh, citizens' taxes. Don't do this. I mean, I'm in a rock between a heart. You know, and I'm in I'm between in the middle of being. I know, I know, ma'am. So I'm doing all I can to respond to the concerns of the citizens and also to the rent to the employees. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Guider, you have any other comment? I don't want to interrupt you. You have anything else you well, want to add? Uh, I, I know I did originally say that about the furloughs, but we were throwing out a whole lot of things at the time, and yeah. and a lot of things have changed. And yeah. when we look at our revenues and everything, you know, we just had a splash a presentation. Uh, splash figures aren't down, but our sales tax. We're telling the citizens it's down, but I forgot about the 3.8 million that was a, added to the budget after um, when we were trying to balance the budget. But it, anyway, uh, we can point fingers all day long, 
we're in a mess and we got to, <laughs> we got to clear it up but we don't want everything going in one direction and, and getting just a certain group of people yes ma'am i understand Thank uh, you. Certainly we, uh, the mess is an overstatement i think we're going to be fine just let us finish it up tomorrow and wait till you hear the the uh, presentation at the public hearing and then you'll decide whether it's a mess or it's, it's okay um sure. uh, vice chairman robinson are you there yeah yeah, I, I don't know where that little sidebar was going, but we, we were not on that track. Um, but I, but I get politics. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's right. It, it's it's you can't be both. You, you, you have to take a position. Either you cut a raise. There is no in between in this place, but you can have a balance. Right. But you can't be so too far to the right, too far to the left that it will break. So you got to find a balance. Right. So I hear the messages. Right. And we can't get convenience and try to throw um, smoke and mirrors and and, and and chaos in the midst of no steady. And nobody confused about what we're looking at. Steady. Take, take your own position and what you see it, what it is. Don't let nobody define for you what it is. Right. So I'm looking at this and I'm looking at this and, and we're we're I wish it would have been a little bit more of a package like Congress, like we're onesie twosie. We're doing the grant thing and then we're doing the this thing. It's like, okay, guys, y'all, it's like, well, whoever has the presence is slipping it in, but it's like, ah, okay, okay. I, I'm just going to deal with this one alone. Uh, and this is sort of like with that health care. Like when, 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 you know, my eye medicine went from $30 a month to $200 a month. I got five, I got four vials. Employees, I get it. Um, this pension thing right here, I was here in 2009 and 10. We, we have a very, we collectively have a rich pension plan. Now listen to the narrative. Like, okay, those are 200 some people that were in, they, they're very well taken care of. Some double taken care of. Okay, yeah. so I get it. Right, right, well taken care of. Right, but uh, if we were matching pound for pound with the employees, from the five to eight percent, I, I think, but that defeats the purpose. But I could, I could accept this. I'm not quite certain this is the lever to use um, to make up the shortfall. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm landing probably in the same place that Madam Guyer, but for a very, very different reason. Um, I agree that let's let's take this out of consent. I, I'm not saying that don't move forward with the consideration and an up or down because you got to move. But that 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 five to eight, it grieves me. It's like, yeah, I get it. But that that's that's future. That 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 that, that that's ongoing. Whereas the Frollo day is right now one time. Right? This is an ongoing increase. Right? You're not getting them an ongoing salary. I heard compression earlier. Well, you can deal with that, you know, you 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 can get there if you advocate for it, but I'm not certain that this is the area. I know the ex the expense associated with the pension. I get it, and I don't disagree. We should come off of, but we're we're in the midst of a moment, and I think that this is, has a long term impact on employees going from five to eight without a match with us. You can't make it up like that. I I just mm, it grieves me. I'm not voting today. It's just like uh, I don't know about this one. Uh, I get it. I appreciate staff looking for every every angle. Everything's on the table. I get it. Just on this one. I don't know about that, but that's just me. And um, I, I agree. Take it out of consent. I'll stand with that. At least you have two people who wants to be as an independent item. Uh, but I, I, I will always respect and honor the full board. I yield, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Lisa, if you could, I would like to take tab number 14 off because I want to, uh, it's, it's no rush because I'm looking at 2021 and we can certainly talk about that a little later because it's not going to be put in those 2020 numbers as we close out the, the, the year. So if we could just take that off the table and take it off the agenda. I don't even want to see it on the agenda tomorrow. Yes, Lisa. Yes, yes. Okay, just yes. take it off. I want to I want to go back and and and, and certainly uh, place some considerations. Again, I've just carried the voices of what I heard on at our uh, mid year budget retreat, but certainly I'm, I'm one that who would negotiate and move and and make adjustments because I understand everybody uh, has bills to pay, hardships and things like that. But certainly we're not going to back off of it. Two, 2010 
and to 2020, 10 year run is a long time to be at 5%. So we will, we will negotiate and determine what we, we will land on the sweet spot, uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, and then we can bring this back to the Board of Commissioners. All right, we're going to move on to tab Madam number. Chair, Madam Chair, hold on, hold on. <coughs> Apologies. I, I, I want to at least speak to this particular issue here just to make sure, because I, I, I think there's a bit of confusion. Um, Mark, this may be for you, and I don't know if Lisa, whomever, or Jennifer, whomever is on the on the uh, on here, and, and maybe even Vice Chair Robinson might could also uh, answer this. Though I thought the five to the eight percent move was to help, and not that I'm for it, but that was part of the numbers and this numbers game that will offset the two point eight nine. 8.85 millage rate and other things and that mark correct me if i'm wrong because i think i heard you say but didn't say that was a part of the whole package deal not that i'm for this but that was part of the whole package deal to offset the numbers that everybody was trying to get to that we short when we're sure falling correct that may or may not have been said but this Increase from five to eight will not affect the 2020 defined benefit pension pay that we have to make. We've already sent that money to Jeb Corp and they've already done the analysis with the actuarials. So uh -huh. what this would do, it would help out next year's number because we would be increasing the payments to Jeb Corp. Okay, but I think- the, So it won't affect 2020. But the perception was, and the conversation was about 2020 the completion of the year, even though you're looking at 2021, because I know I'm a part of the defined benefits and I think getting rid of that would be ludicrous, uh, but that's whomever's opinion. Um, but with that, understood now. So the clarity is we were only speaking for 2021 moving forward. Not yes, it would only help out 2021's okay. numbers because 2020 has already been calculated. I got you, and I'm, I, I understand it. I, I just want to make sure for clarity. But I think the misconception was this was a part of it in its entirety to complete the year and 2021. But that's okay. I, 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 I've never been, you know, all in on that anyway. But that's kind of how I receive that information versus. Uh, what you're telling me now, though. So, uh, with that being clear, though, 2021 is pulled off the consent agenda, and you're right, there is still time. But I guess going back to Vice Chair Robinson, will the numbers work without it? If it does, we're we're going in the right direction. But if it doesn't, now we're back to something different than what we've already advertised, with the possibility of this possible millage rate increase and furlough days. And so Mark, if you'll do me a favor and, and Vice Chair Robinson, I think you can probably handle this with me as well. Let's go back and look at the numbers to make sure that all the numbers add up to what we needed to add up to. Once we are done with this, we're done with this. Not that it doesn't, the numbers doesn't match the, the where we're going with trying to um, get through the end of the year and be prepared for 2021. So uh, I guess I'll lean to my colleague, uh, Vice Chair Robinson. I don't know if you can kind of comment to that, Vice Chair Robinson. I'm assuming you'll take it up in the Finance Committee and, and make sure kind of what that looks like and what that truly, the numbers, that it does make sense that we can pull this off without that or that's inclusive. So I guess I want to pose that first question to uh, Vice Chair Robinson. I don't know if he wants to comment on that, but if not, then I'm going to, I, I'm not in my head. Finalist committee. Oh, oh okay. okay. Yeah, finance. Cool okay. beans. All right. So on that note, Fred, okay. Thank you very much. But but I hope that we will not even think about relieving ourselves of the defined benefits side of this and, and take that away from the from the uh, employees of Douglas County. I hope that's that's not an option. At least not for me. It would never ever be an option. There's too many benefactors there to um, just take that off the table 
I mean, not the 3% I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the overall package of what we deal with with ACCG. So, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much, and I yield. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner. All right, we're going to move on. I have uh, one that we slipped in on us, which is, uh, um, and Mark, before I uh, move to tab number 16, I'm sorry, before I move to tab number 15 and 16, I want to see if I could slip Mil Milton Kidd in. Milton, are you available? Milton Kidd. Uh, Milton has, uh, Board of Commissioners, he's going to bring a discussion to you about regarding absentee mail-out uh, ballots here in Douglas County. Milton, would you please present to the Board of Commissioners? Yes, ma'am. Let me remove my mask because I'm in the office right now. Okay. Okay. Essentially, uh, well, this came, this initiative came from a lot of uh, different citizens and including representatives that represent Douglas County. Those representatives uh, consist of Representative Roger Bruce, Representative Kimberly Alexander, Representative uh, William Bodie, Representative Sean Beasley Teagues, and Representative Donzella James. These representatives, along with a myriad of other uh, citizens uh, through their phone calls and through their emails to the Board of Elections and Registrations, have asked for essentially what uh, the state uh, did for the citizens of Douglas County during the June 9th uh, general primary election. They would like uh, all citizens of Douglas County to receive a pre-field voter registration, uh, not voter registration, a pre-field absentee ballot application for the November 3rd election. This uh, application would go out to all of the citizens where they're able to send that back in through a myriad of ways to request a ballot for the November general third uh, general election. Now, one of the reasons that they were asking about this is uh, some of the, the issues that uh, Cobb Douglas Health uh, brought up today with the fact that Douglas County still has elevated numbers as far as uh, its overall COVID-19 uh, epidemic going forward. It was interested in their meeting uh, today with giving facts and figures from COVID-19 that uh, one of, well, I guess the current spike actually happened around the July uh, timeframe, which I conclude may have been one of the uh, contributing factors from one of the things that even the governor's office has requested that municipal governments and governments in general and the general public uh, do, that is limiting the number of people that are gathered in large social settings. We do know that the November 3rd general election will be what uh, elections officials are terming as the largest election in U.S. history at this point. So essentially we're trying to mitigate an efforts to take out what would be probably upwards of 30,000 people from polling locations by allowing them an opportunity that they currently have, an opportunity to submit an absentee ballot by mail and not have those individuals waiting in line, not have those individuals interacting with the general public in confined uh, locations and polling locations and essentially becoming vectors throughout Douglas County that could potentially spread COVID-19. We are asking in a petition from the county today to allot $100,000 in CARES Act funding to the department to be able to utilize uh, with this absentee ballot mail initiative to the citizens of Douglas County. I'm an individual that believes in facts and figures and giving people the numbers. So let me give you the, num the numbers. For 2016 presidential election year, Douglas County uh, processed 2,409 absentee ballots, uh, ap absentee ballots and applications. For 2012, we processed 2,358. And that is in comparison to the June 9th general primary where we processed 20, well, over 21,000 absentee ballot applications. 
we were able to, uh, with that, take out that number of individuals from being in enclosed spaces and potentially becoming uh, vectors to spread COVID-19. Uh, the state has uh, made these funds available to municipal and local governments to address possible uh, impacts of COVID-19. And I feel that this particular uh, issue does fall within those guidelines and it is something that the county can look at as a proactive step in order to reduce those number of people being uh, at polling locations. Now that helps from my perspective, this is good for poll workers because these are in most cases, well, in every case, these are citizens of Douglas County that are participating in their civic duty by working uh, a polling location. But I, as their director, have to do everything within my power to help mitigate their exposure to COVID-19 and help protect them and their families and the overall community. And I think for me, this is a this is one of the steps that the county uh, can take to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and protect its citizenry. This is, uh, I understand that this is a big ax for the county, but those funds have been made available for such resources. So at this time, I'm asking uh, Douglas County to allot this department those funds in order to be able to address the concerns of the citizens of Douglas County. Okay, um, thank you. Are you finished, Director? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, before I yield to the Board of Commissioners, certainly just had a question for you. You know, with this uh, last absentee ballot process, the citizens all over the state of Georgia had an opportunity to go to an app or, I guess, online to look to see if their vote, uh, if their uh, absentee ballot had been received. Uh, will we have that mechanism in place here in Douglas County so they could just make sure that their ballots were received? Do you have, are we that sophisticated or if, can you share with me? Yes, ma'am. The actual app is the My Voter Page Georgia app. When mm -hmm. citizens go on this application and enter their first initial, their last name, the county in which you live, and your date of birth, there is a feature on there that once you have submitted an absentee ballot application to this office, and we have acknowledged receipt of that application by entering into what is called the election net system, which is what all of the counties in Georgia use to process voter registration applications and absentee ballot applications. It sends a record to your Georgia My Voter page that shows that we have uh, essentially uh, accepted that application in. And when it comes time to actually checking the ballots themselves, it'll also show that your ballot has been accepted back into our office. So yes, ma'am, we do have that capacity. Okay, very good. I just wanted to know, Eunice, from, from a um, technology standpoint, I know we're uh, under your leadership, we're pretty sophisticated, but I wanted you to be able to share that information with the citizens. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions for our Director of um, Board of Elections? Vice Chairman Robinson. All right, so uh, I get it. Um, uh, we have received um, federal funding, uh, regardless of whether it was direct or via via the state. There is money uh, that can be used to cover uh, increased expenses associated with our COVID situation, uh, current situation. And so what I'm hearing is that um, we've got a million six up front, up to five million dollars net difference um, to use uh, accordingly. Um, and so I'm hearing that out of that money, I want to be clear of source of funding that we're looking to take in addition to the other uh, ask for economic development, a hundred grand. I'm now hearing a, a hundred grand for. Um, um, for this election, which I'm I'm fine with, I, I just want it's all about the source of funding, so that we can, because uh, you got two di two different money things we're dealing with, right? Our operational costs and then our increased costs associated with COVID, um, mm -hmm. and so I just want to be sure that I'm I'm clear. So the money, the county administrator, so to cover this cost, um, 
have we received the $1.6 million initially associated with COVID? And if we got cash in hand, not just what we gonna get the check, cash in hand from that 1.6, then that 100 will come from that. Or is this a deferred, we've got to spend the money up front with reimbursement later? Can you just help me? Uh, Milton, this is not for you to, you're okay. Mark, can you help me understand the cash flow, please? Yes, yeah, so uh, we have received the 1.6. We still, we have submitted uh, documentation for the 1.6, and we're waiting to hear back uh, approval on that. Once we receive that, then we will submit for the remaining up to 5.5. .5. So did we, we we did receive a check for 1.6? Yes, sir. Have we spent all that money? Have we? Uh, I know we had intentions, but is that 1.6 gone? Uh, yes, pretty close. Do you have a hundred thousand difference? And pretty close. And it's okay, whatever the answer is. I just want to know. Um, Sabrina, can you answer that? Where we? Uh... Yeah, I have the code. So if you include, go ahead, Sabrina. Um, right now, we've spent right at 1.5, but if we include the 200000 then, yeah, it's all more than gone. All right. So to the Board of Commissioners, we've got priorities here. Ballots or grants, right, for the current round. Else, that means that that's money in hand, which means that we would have to go into our general fund to, with the expectation that we get reimbursed later. You know, however long it takes, 30 days, 30 minutes, I don't know what the process is, but you guys get the point. Pay attention to the flow. There's a lot of stuff that's being thrown at us, and I get it. But, I mean, we're, we're here. We're paid $2.50 to show up every two weeks to get a $100 million spend. Right? So I, I, this is for the citizens. Like, now think about what we're being asked to do. And I know these meetings are, they get long sometimes, but think about what we got to be able to process right here in the moment. Right here in the moment. We don't live here day to day. So for my peers' sake, uh, you, you have a, I, I'm not opposed to anything. I just want to make sure that you're clear that um, we can do $100,000 sounds like we can do this ballot as a priority now with no drag on the general fund. Uh, the 200000 that's being asked or whatever the number was from earlier, all right, it may not have made the cut. I don't know. Um, but But again, pay attention. Um, just pay attention. Um, and uh, I'm just going to leave it at that, Madam Chair. I'm fine with the agenda as is um, if you're adding this for tomorrow um, to get ahead. Thank you. I yield. Okay. Any other questions? I see Commissioner Guider. Oh, well, you know what? Uh, Commissioner Guider, before you chime in, I'll let you go first, and then uh, we have the attorney Bernard behind you. Commissioner Guider, please. Well, I'll, I'd like to hear what he has to say. <laughs> and I'll yield it to him, and then I can go. Thank okay, Commissioner. Okay, Attorney Bernard. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair and board members, can you hear me okay? Yeah, talk, speak up just a little louder, okay. Attorney. Uh, Milton had this cleared through legal. There's no nothing in state law that prohibits uh, this uh, particular practice, at least right now. I should make you aware that the state has gone through recently and announced they'll have an online web portal to be able to request absentee ballots online. Of course, that wouldn't necessarily help somebody that doesn't have access to those facilities to be able to request it. But I do want to ask Milton one thing to be cautious about. He, Milton used the word pre-filled. Uh, I'd be very cautious about pre-filling anything on a uh, absentee ballot application. I think that might be considered uh, assisting the voter, which would have to be signed off on. So just let's take a look at that particular language before that happens, if the board moves in this direction. Two things. The pre-filled portion of the voter registration application is not a pre-filled application as far as what you would think is pre-filled. The pre-filled portion means to say that this voter, which, uh, which is attached to this voter registration, uh, application is submitting this application. The application process itself requires that the voter have what's called a wet signature on the application. So the applicant has to still sign and acknowledge that they are requesting a absentee ballot application. What the pre-field portion does, it allows us to add a barcode 
for faster processing of absentee ballot applications. So it essentially marks that this application belongs to this voter, but this voter still has to sign and date that application. So, Milton, that's the only portion that's pre-filled in that boat, that code that ties it in. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. That's all I have, Madam Chair. And, and Milton had cleared this previously, so he's correcting his request, and it'll, it's up to y'all what y'all do. Okay. Thank you so much, Milton, for bringing this forth. Commissioner Guider, do you have anything? In? I was, you know, you said you wanted to wait on yeah. 10. Okay. Thank you. Um, Milton, um, Last time, did y'all mail those uh, applications for absentee ballots out or did it come directly from the state? It came directly from the state. Okay, how many of those were returned? Do you know by the we, post office? Uh, I don't have re returned as in uh, how many turned back in? Not, de not deliverable. Uh, not deliverable. I don't. I don't have the undeliverable uh, numbers uh, with that, but uh, like I said, we did process 21,000. Uh, I, I can say the, the state did send out uh, roughly 96,000 uh, applications to the voters of Douglas County at that time. But I will say this too, though, even being able to take 20, 30, 40, I'm seeing some uh, estimates of upwards of 50,000 people out of polling locations on uh, election day and advanced voting. I think that these are legitimate and tangible steps that we can take as a county to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and not have individuals that are, in most cases, of the most compromised uh, health groups inside of polling locations. Okay, um, when I was tax commissioner and we mailed out all these tax bills and everything, we would get like three or four trays of return mail where people had moved or they had um, died or whatever, you know. Um, we had to research to find out whether or not the property had sold, whatever. But um, I have a problem, and of course this is, party lines. Everybody knows this. I'm going to say it. <laughs> this is party lines. Everybody that you read, all the representatives and the senators, they're all Democrats, and we all know that. Um, but there's a lot of people out in, in the public that are very concerned about the integrity of the vote, because you don't have to show any kind of ID in order to do to vote. Uh, someone is on camera, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, dumping a whole bag full of ballots in the mailbox up at the courthouse. Now, did you have any more uh, drop boxes? You know, IRS, you have to have it postmarked by a certain day, and uh, the post office gets out there, and they collect it. You drive through, you hand it to them, and, and, and that's everybody out here, everybody. So are you looking outside the box how you can handle the numbers without mailing out a bunch of uh, applications um, that could, okay. we know it could be can, defrauded. Can, can I address that. those questions? Okay, uh -huh. a couple things. You do have to show identification to vote absentee by mail. My office, Every application for an absentee ballot, no matter if it's on one of the applications we submit or if it's a voter printing out that application and sending it in themselves, every application that comes into this office, the signature on that application is checked against your voter registration file. We also have access to driver services. So we pull your driver's license, including the signature which you provided to driver services and match that to the application itself as well. There are a myriad of safety protocols in place when dealing with absentee balloting requests. I will also say that along the lines of this being a partisan issue, um, th these are facts and figures. 
prior to 2020's election year, the largest number of individuals for Douglas County and throughout the state of Georgia that requested absentee ballots were members of the Republican Party. This, uh, this idea of the safety of absentee balloting, this is relatively new uh, inclination of an idea that has just uh, come about during this 2020 election cycle. Now, to address the second issue that you uh, stated with an individual dropping off absentee ballots at a drop box location, the state of Georgia, and we follow all of the rules of the state of Georgia, the state of Georgia has a specific uh, grouping of individuals who you can return their ballot for, whether they be elderly and disabled parents, a, a sibling or a daughter, uh, it even outlines nieces and nephews. If you actually get an absentee ballot request form, on that form it outlines who can return the ballot of such individual. So any individual that was dropping into uh, ballots into a Dropbox location, you can see what the relationship to those individuals for those ballots that those individuals are returning. There are safety protocols in place with dealing with absentee. I will say that every state in the union has some form of, of mail-in voting. This is one of the things that we can do that we know that the CDC has said uh, that will help reduce the overall spread of COVID-19. We're approaching uh, the at this point, the fall and winter season with what will be a heavier than normal flu season on top of COVID-19 uh, COVID that can potentially put a strain on communities that our own uh, Cub, Cub uh, Douglas uh, Health has said that we are already above the numbers where we should be as a community. So any steps that we can take to reduce or mitigate our overall impact, I think are within reason. So you, you're saying that you've got everybody's signature on file. We have access uh, to, whenever you turn in an application. You to have this access, office, but how many of the absentee yeah. ballots do you actually check? We check every absentee ballot application. We check every absentee ballot itself for a signature. We, can, we cannot legally reject a uh, ballot until it has been verified by at least three members of my staff to check those signatures. Even when uh, there's a discrepancy with the signature, then the state has implemented what is called a cure affidavit protocol or how to reach out to voters and the different ways in which we're legally required to reach out to voters that there are any citizens, that there are any issues with their signature. And anyone uh, that wants, I know our time is limited in, in this session, but anyone that wants to reach out uh, to the office to exactly go over how we check signatures and how we verify that, I will be more than happy to sit down with yourself or any other members uh, of the board that are concerned with the integrity of the vote. My uh, goal as the elections director is to make sure that Douglas County always has free and fair elections following all uh, protocols. I will say too though, the state does verify every uh, absentee ballot request that uh, we send out. They verify the form that we reject. They go over and cross-examine our either rejection or acceptance of signatures as well. These are steps that are already being taken and will continue to be taken for the citizens of Douglas County. Well, um, when I went to vote and uh, when I went in to vote uh, in the primary, there was, I was, there was no line. I walked right up to the table and it took, I know, 20 minutes for them to do whatever they were doing in the computer. So what, what are they doing in the computer that would take that long to wait on one customer? Okay. When you came and voted in the primary, I, uh, I am hesitant to look at a voter's file and discuss this type of information on uh, camera. But had you requested an absentee ballot prior no. to... Okay. No. When you go in, when you go into a... Well, you, saw, you said computers, so that means you advanced voting. 
when you go into advanced vote, we have access uh, to the entire voter file because anyone out of Douglas County can come to any one of our advanced voting locations and early vote. One of the steps with coming in, we check what's called your election net file to make sure that we have not issued you an absentee ballot of any sort. If an absentee ballot has been issued, then we have to cancel out that live ballot in order to let you vote in. But, but the person said that he was having to fill me out an absentee ballot. So that, that kind of confused me. Okay. Uh, advanced in person is absentee. Advanced in person is absentee in person because you're outside of the polling location on election day. But as far as paperwork uh, is concerned, it is still an, an absentee in person ballot. So you have absentee in person and then you have absentee by mail. So there are two different sides of the same coin. They're both counted in facts and figures as absentee. Okay, um, just to put my two cents out there, I'm against mailing just absentee ballots. And this is what is on the agenda to send out ab absentee ballots. This is, we're not asking to send out absentee ballots. You cannot legally send out an absentee ballot without a request. What we're asking is to be able to disseminate the request to the citizens of Douglas County. But it's not on the agenda. <laughs> it's not on the agenda. That's what's confusing. But uh, anyway, uh, just my my opinion, I don't think we ought to do this. And I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner um, Guider. Thank you so much. Uh, Lisa, if you could, Tamar, put this on as a new business item. I, I, I hear some uh, different opinions from our boards. So I wanted everybody to be able to weigh in accordingly tomorrow regarding this request. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Director Kidd. All right, we're gonna move to tab number, we're almost there, y'all. We're gonna move to tab number 15, authorization to approve a license agreement with the Douglas County School System for use of the Douglas County radio system and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Uh, County Administrator, Mark Teal. Uh, yes, ma'am. So we've been in discussion, as you're aware, with Mr. North of the Douglas County School System and he's in agreement with the numbers that are included in this, in this agreement. <clears throat> so it essentially allows the school system, uh, their new, more specifically, their new police force, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, um, to use. So they would have to purchase the radios. They would maintain the radios. They would pay us $735 per radio per year to help go towards our maintenance of the entire system. And they would pay $250,000 uh, one time upfront fee. So that's essentially what's included in the agreement. I think we have, it's a, Mr. North requested a 10 year agreement. And I think there's a, there's an opt out clause in there as well. It's for both parties. Okay. Thank you so much, County Administrator. Board of Commissioners, you have any comments? Or, okay. That's sounds oh, commission. Yeah, I, I'll just add. Uh, great just job, Mark. Oh, was that for me? Okay, I can. I can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you did say I can go ahead and take the floor, correct? You can, and then commissioner okay. guidance next. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So, so Mark, uh, great job. I'm glad we was able to kind of pull this off. But I guess my other question though is, um, I'm, I'm having a senior moment. Uh, you said something about uh, Jesus. I, I, I was never asked you a question about the whole makeup, which is fine. What we got, uh, what, I, what my question I think was in the, the oh legal. So has has uh, um, Ken and those guys had a chance to look at this? Yes, sir. And I, I guess they they want to wait and comment tomorrow, or do Ken? Well, we've made some minor changes. Legal made some minor changes, and we've already incorporated those into the agreement. Got it, got it. That, that's okay. correct, Commissioner. Okay, so those minor changes, are they, do we need to make those public now or should we wait until tomorrow or does that really matter? Or, or it wasn't, it was insignificant. And it's included in the agreement that's attached in the packet. Yeah, that is what y'all have. Agreement. Say again, Ken, I'm sorry, Mark. Say again, Ken. Y'all, the, the, there's, the, the agreement attached to the pack is the one that had our changes already in it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't think I have any other questions, but I, I just know we, you know, great job in trying to get us to this point. And, and a special thanks to um, Commissioner Carson, who kind of led this charge on all of this. And, and you know, kind of, Mark, when we all have these, you know, conversations and, you know, trying to get to this point. So, I'm, I'm, you know, kudos to her. So, outside of that, I'll yield. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, any other questions for Mark? Uh, uh, Commissioner Guide, I saw your hand. Yes, uh, Mark, could you repeat those figures? 250,000 up front. Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. 250,000 is a one time upfront payment that would be due within 10 days of execution of the agreement um, or the execution date. They would pay $735 per radio per year to help out with our maintaining the system but they would have to purchase their own radios and they would have to maintain their own radios. So do you know how much the annual payout would be from the school board? I know we lost a half a million dollars when they- well, It depends on how their, many, uh, it depends on how many radios, but the number I heard was around 35. So that would be, hold on one second. $25,725, but that'd be based on 35 radios. They could have 40, they could have 30. Okay, and how many radios do we have? Will we have about, do you have any idea? I do not know. Uh, okay. Jason or Scott, or either one of you on here? That's okay, uh, I don't yeah, want to hold I don't know. Not sure how many. We have a lot, but I don't know how many. I don't know the exact number. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'll go back. Thank you. Okay, Madam, thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, just, just to point out, there were two minor changes that had to do with typos this morning that may not be in your packet. I just wanted to uh, follow back on Commissioner. Mitchell's question that the substantive changes are in the package that y'all have. There were two minor typos we saw this morning, and Lisa has the corrected version of it. But nothing, uh, no substantive changes other than what you have before you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Attorney Bernard. Uh, uh -huh. I heard Commissioner yes. uh, Robinson first, and then okay. you, Commissioner Carthen. Okay, That's Commissioner fine. Robinson, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be quick. Um, so I just for the record, I I think I heard you guys say it was going to be a two hundred fifty thousand dollars one time upfront fee. Uh, I came in at when we first discussed this about three fifty. Um, um, I, I see that it 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 was negotiated down. Um, I duly noted that's what my peers um, support. I, I yield to that. And the reason I, I had a 350 footprint um, or initial figure, and again, I don't negotiate against myself, is the fact that well, we put 15 million into this system up front. Right? 15, which I get it. Right? And so I'm looking at one time 15 million in for us, day 250 versus 350, all things being equal. For them to, to have the same type of coverage, they'd had to put in 15 million. But okay, we work with our partners in the community, and we tend to try to accommodate. Well, we'll we'll do the heavy lifting, right? Just like with roads, we'll, we'll pick up Riverside and you know from the city and in and, and Chicago Avenue and the things that we do. We we're the county. We carry the burden. Seven percent of that tax dollar off the property. What roughly goes to the school board, but yet we have the majority of the population. If we got twenty-five thousand kids, if we got a hundred thousand adults, easy math. You have to give balance to sort of like, okay, I get it. Pay attention to the numbers, right? We we the county carries the load. I, I get it. We're the linebackers. We we do it all. We, we'll cover everything else. I get it, but I, I want to make sure we get credit for what we carry. Right? We, we we have to do everything else with less. How convenient. I get to school, we should take care of the hearth of the county, of the community. 
it's all about the school, no problem. Well, let's make sure that, that we get the proper credit for being as efficient as we can, but only 30% of the property tax. And having to protect when them kids walk off that campus that we got to take care of the whole system. Right? So I, I want to make sure as we get into these numbers, it's, no, I got your school board. All right, 250 in. You would have to build your own system at 15 million, but okay, we got you. But for the greater for the greater constituents out there, like let's make sure we're getting our proper credit as a board of commissioners. That like, look, we're, we're we care. We, we try to leverage. We we try to help. We try to be sensitive. But there is um and, and we we try to be practical in how we approach um, costs. Um, again, I would have still. Like 350 on this, but if that was the number that looks like you guys worked through a 250, I'm, I'm going to let that go for now because it's all relative to me um, at that that dollar point. So again, um, move forward, and I, I yield, Madam Chair. I'm good. Thank you. Did we lose me? I'm I'm sorry. Okay, as long as you were there, we're good. Thank you. Yes, uh, ma'am. Commissioner Carson, you have the floor, and then we're going to move on. Uh, Got you. I, I will be really succinct. We we did um, look at what the school board proposed. Uh, one of the things that I just want everybody who's listening to this to understand is that the BOC, the BOE, the city, all of the taxes that are going up, no one wants taxes to go up. But as you see, there are services that are needed in order to keep this county going. And my thought in working with the school board was to ensure that they had the services that they need at a cost that they could afford as well. If we all work together to keep costs down, all of us as taxpayers won't really feel the burden or it won't be as big of a burden as, uh, as anticipated. I hope we all come to the table and do our part in helping us all to keep the burden down including with the Board of Education. That was it, Madam Chair. I just wanted people to know we are trying to work with all of our governments and our elected officials in order to keep the cost for this county low or reasonable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carton. All right, if there's no other contribution for this discussion, we're gonna move on to last but not least, and it is tab number 16, is approval to amend the 2020 budget to reflect the following. We have Sabrina Cogborn. Uh, Mark, is she planning to present today or you just wanted this to be on the agenda? What what was the plan? No, she can go over the numbers if you would okay. like, or we can wait for oh, tomorrow. Yeah, anyway. that's, that's, that's fine. We Okay, uh, Sabrina Cogborn, you have the floor through our uh, assistant director of finance. I'm going to pull it up. Mm -hmm. Can everyone see that? Mm, no. Not uh, this. Let me now try turning can. my camera off. Oh, y'all can see it now? Okay. Yes. Um, and I do want to kind of jump back to talk about what Commissioner Mitchell was asking because it all relates with the millage rate, and part of this includes some of the DV. That five, that five to three, eight percent does not affect how we are with our millage rate. That was never calculated in. I think the confusion was we did the DB presentation the same time as the mid-year retreat, and the, we gave you all a half a million figure if it was changed right now from the estimated covered payroll. But again, that's just to go towards the liability if it started right now. So that would not affect millage rate. That doesn't affect our projections because, as Mark said, we've got the invoice already. They're not going to do a, another actuarial evaluation on us. So um, this number, I just sent out another one this morning. We had to alter it somewhat. Um, but you can see the total uh, general fund expense cut right here is the $2.9 million. We actually had departments submit over $4 million in cuts. The reason you're showing it a little lower is since we're going to go ahead and give everybody a more accurate picture of where we stand, we went ahead and added in the required portion of the DB. Now, if the board chooses to go back in and add in and want to pay the recommended, which is about $1.3 million higher, we can do that and amend the budget at that time. But since we know we have to pay the required, we went ahead and added it in. So. The departments really did come up that four million dollars was including the remaining BIRs, um, any kind of frozen positions, pretty much reduction in all training, and then just cuts within all their other lines. So we ended up getting about 2.9 million net, but it was four million, and then when you took out the DB, that's where we get the 2.9. 
But then we also, we're going to show one picture. We have to do the revenues. So it was about 11.6 million. And I won't, it's a lot. We adjusted every line. Some went up, some went down. But just to give you a summary of that, um, that's reducing loss, 5 million. And that's to keep it flat for July through December, which would just be the same as we received last year. And as you'll see in this afternoon's finance committee, we feel confident that that'll be no issue. And that's kind of where it's trending. Um, we're going to reduce TABT 2.7 million. That's estimating 350 per month for July through December. And again, in tonight's or this afternoon's finance committee, I'm going to go over a new house bill that took effect where we've been seeing a lot of increases in TABT, but the state was noticing that counties and school boards were receiving a large increase due to the percentage change, but cities were not getting a lot. So they have actually reversed the fees of what the cities and the counties get to try and correct that. So we know with that, and then obviously with the economy that affects TABT. Um, intergovernmental, since we're not having the SROs, we had to reduce the budget for that payment. It's about 500,000. Uh, charges for services, as you know, parks, recs, libraries, Connect Douglas, all those have been closed down or limited. So we're reducing that about 500,000. Courts and law enforcement, same limited operations, 1.5 million. And then since we're removing the BIRs, we have to remove the revenue side. Uh, the sheriff was going to give 500000 for equipment, so we had to take that out. Um, so that's kind of just the large ticket summaries. I don't think, I mean, if you guys want, I can send you all the detailed line. I mean, it's large spreadsheets, but that's going to get you to that 11.6. So the net impact to the general fund is going to be a negative 8.6 or almost $8.7 million. And then the other funds, unincorporated, and have had about 30, almost 34,000 in cuts, fire and EMS, 117 in cuts, and then animal control had about 77,000 in cuts. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, thank you so much, Sabrina. If you could just tell them what the initial uh, approved budget was for 2020 and what the, your amended amount, I believe they want to hear bottom line. Yeah. What? So the amended amount will be, we're going to be reducing it eight point, almost 8.7 million. And then the, hold on, let me pull up what the total is. Yeah. What was the total? So the uh, amended amount was right now we're at 101, 101.6 million, and we're amending it down about 8.2. So what is that number? So, the, so that's 101.6 minus. So that's going to take us around 93 million. Okay. Okay. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear the, the you know, high level. That's just for the general fund. The other funds are obviously will be separate, but that's the biggest, you know, where we're. Okay. Okay. Any questions from the board or comments? Or I apologize. That's the net impact. We're talking about just the revenues. Are you wanting to separate it? The revenues will be 101.6 minus. So the revenues are going down to about 91, but the expenses are going from 104 million to, they're going down to 101.1. So the revenues are where you're gonna see the biggest reduction. That's the 91 million, but the expenses are gonna be brought to 101.1 million. All right, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Commissioner uh, Guido, you're next. <laughs> Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna just for my peers. I haven't seen this. This is my first time hearing it. I'm sure I'm gonna take this up in our finance committee here, which I think we're running over for. We'll get there soon. But what I heard was a net difference, um, just for the sake of the moment. That expenses dropped from 104 to 101, which is three, and our revenues dropped from 101 to 93. That's eight plus three is 11. Did I do that right? It's a net difference. Yeah, no, the net difference is going to be about 8.7, but the yeah. revenues are going to go down 11.6 and expenses are going down 2.9. All right, we're close enough. Matt. I got it. Mm -hmm. I get yeah, point. close. Yeah. No, we're good. So, so there's still um, a gap that to my peers, we have to answer in the next three meetings to over two weeks, eight days. Um, so just be thoughtful. I appreciate um, what I'm hearing the administration do is is addressing um, succinctly um, how we're going to get there. Right? There's only so much that we can do 
from an administrative with only three months, three and a half months left. Time is running out, All right? So you got time and money are the issues here, All right? And so I'm hopeful that, the, and it sounds like I, I, I see it. The administration is working toward, they are working on things that I, I hear them, but they've got to go into effect ASAP to even be materialized. It's one thing to say it on paper. It's another that, that practically, there's some of the things that are being offered, like can you pull them off in the time that's remaining to realize the yield? And that's my, my I, I hope that and it's, it's something that, that that aggregated voice that all these constitutional officers, all these departments who, who said yes, 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 are y'all gonna be able to pull it off? I hear you. But can you pull it off in a way that we're going to realize the yield by agreeing to this 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 modification? So, I think I've made my point. Um, again, I'm sure once we get into finance, we'll get into a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. and I have a little bit stronger opinion or position for my peers. But today, right now at this moment, I don't because it's the first time I saw this. So, Madam Chair, I'm going to yield the floor back to you. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Guider, you have the floor. Yes. Uh uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this, too. <laughs> uh, uh, when will we be getting a financial report as of the end of July? That's in this afternoon's finance committee meeting. I sent it out yes. Sunday. You sent it out where? Sunday. Yesterday. Okay. Well, I was out of it as soon as this is done. I was out of town, was not able to, to look at anything this weekend. Um, but um, it seems like someone had told me that the sheriff was only, had, had given a uh, 100,000 back, and now it's uh, up to a million. So is this including anything that's been done since we had our last meeting? This, yeah. Has this been changed at all? <laughs> That's correct. Mark has reached out to all departments and then Madam Chair reached out to the Sheriff's Department and um, they were able to cut that. So the, where you're getting the Sheriff, why it's over a million, it's 993000 for that lease purchase from the Tahoes that was a BIR. And then he also gave us a cut on his part-time salaries and then also on his detention about 70000 on overtime. So this was all after we met Mark just you know, reached out to all his department heads and asked how you can cut. The chair went to elected officials, and this is just reflective of those numbers. So we can amend the budget if you guys choose so. So the finance committee reports do look more accurate, and you see where, and like uh, Commissioner Robinson spoke about, they just say all of our training has so far said to amend it down, take it from them now, so they're not tempted to spend it, just to be safe than sorry. And if something comes up, y'all have the option to give it back down the road. But this way, it forces them to stay strict and tight and try and cut costs as much as possible with the pandemic. So they were not given a certain amount that they had to cut. Um, and did every department cooperate? Um, most all departments, and I, I sent out something this morning, but I can send it to your personal too, or I can pull it back up. Let me see if I can pull it back up where you guys can see it. Okay. Yes, Commissioner, while she's pulling it up, I just want to let you know that the, the elected officials and the constitutional officers really worked hard when we were at at our mid-year budget retreat, certainly I told you that I we had not solidified all the information, so I saw the propaganda that hit the streets real quickly, but we were working and we are continuing to work, and those numbers, I, I, as I say, the fever is coming down tremendously. So um, uh, we've been trying to send things to your email. I saw the report that you sent last night, Sabrina, to Commissioner Guider, and to all of us, which is that finance report. So uh, Sabrina, you have the floor again. Can you all see it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So here you can see pre pretty much every department, um, they responded to Mark. And if Mark thought there was more after he looked at it, he you know, emailed back. Unfortunately, there are some departments that are just smaller and they don't have the budget. But, I mean, 90% of your departments, you can tell, all sent in a good amount. I'm not sure if you guys can kind of see it all. And the reason why general appropriations, again, is a negative, because I had to add in the um, 
DB. So it kind of took away from part of that cut. But you can see everybody, you know, was very cooperative and tried a lot. And if you take out the DB, this 2.9 million goes to 4 million. So everybody came together and found 4 million to cut from their budget. Okay, I'll wait for the financial um, because uh, I'd, I'd like to see about the revenues. I know Splosh is not down. Uh, there we were up a little bit from last year, but we were told that um, sales tax was down uh, 40%, but I think that's over and above what 2019 uh, reflected anyway. So um, anyway, let me look. I'll I'll look at the financial uh, because we're getting it in bits and pieces. It's very difficult <laughs> to put it all together. I wish we were at a round table where we could take a pencil and mark this off and mark this off, but we're we're not. It's very difficult doing it this way. So I yield back. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. I believe the Board of Commissioners framed what they were looking for, and we have certainly done that. You will hear the presentation tomorrow. I think you'll be quite uh, satisfied with what we have done. Uh, again, we can all sit at the table with the pencil or you all give me and the, the, the administration the ability to get it down and bring you the information back. So I think you'll be quite pleased tomorrow. Okay, with that being said, if there, uh, Mark Till has one other thing and then we're gonna have to wrap this up and then uh, Board of Commissioners, I really appreciate your time and talent today. Yes, ma'am, so really quick, and sorry, I received this email about the first 30 minutes of the, our board meeting. So we have a have received a maintenance agreement for the I-20 landscaping. That is the last uh, document that needs to be signed before we can get permits. Um, so if it pleases the board, we can put that on the agenda tomorrow for new business. I've already sent it to the clerk. And it's a, it's a standard agreement from Georgia DOT. It's a maintenance agreement for the I-20 landscaping. Okay. Board of Commissioners, I hope you're okay with that. We've certainly been waiting on this agreement for quite a while from GDOT. So I have no problem with it being added. So, Clerk, if you could just add it to the agenda tomorrow on the new business. Hey, Mark. Okay. I'm okay. Manager. Yes. Mark, Commissioner is, Mitchell. Is there any cost to us on this, or is it just all GDOT? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Uh, is there any cost to us, to, to the commission, or is it all GDOT? What, what's the match? Up? What's the matching plan? Yes. So actually, I think the estimate is once the landscaping is finished, um, you're looking at about fifty thousand dollars per year to maintain it. Georgia DOT will not maintain uh, the landscaping on I-20. We would be required to maintain it. Okay. So we're looking at fifty thousand dollars to some, maintain. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So if tree funds are available, we can use uh, tree fund money for the maintenance of these locations. Right now we're using, of course, we don't know what the cost is, but um, we'll probably use most all of it for the actual construction and installation. So we're gonna use the tree fund money to do all the installation. So that's whatever matching funds that we're dealing with with GDOT on this round. Then after yes. that, then after that, we're looking at maintenance of at least fifty thousand dollars to cover it. I'm assuming that's not per one, but that's all uh, is that is that fifty thousand fifty thousand dollars per uh intersection or I mean uh exit ramps or or help me out so I make sure I'm I'm just wanna make yeah, sure I'll have to confirm I but it's my understanding it was for all four but I will confirm. Please do so we can make sure because I, I think we gotta make sure that we we count the as, Commissioner Robinson states that we follow the money and make sure that we're following the dollars and assuring that we're not digging the hole even deeper. That's what we're already dealing with. Not that I don't want to do it. I just want to make sure that, okay, we just added this to this. We just added to, to possibly do mail out to tell everybody they can, you know, do absentee ballots or, you know, do we take a different approach? But I'm just making sure that we understand that we, we could be adding, no, we are adding an expense period. Correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. Well stated. How are you at that point? Won't hit. That expense won't happen until um, probably the early part of uh, 2021. Right. I get it. Because we've got the tree fund that we can use to offset the cost now. 
but you know, th there's not much tree fund money coming in though that I can think of unless there's some building. Yeah, there has been here lately. We received right. a big check earlier this year. Right, because there, there's some developing going on, but I don't know, Mark, based on you know the real estate market. Yeah, can't uh, can't predict it. No, and it's slowing down. Just FYI. So mm -hmm. it's, it, we just haven't seen the slowdown yet because of kind of what's happening with within this COVID nineteen. Uh, we can we can expect a significant change in in real estate whether it's coming to the, the, the cost of properties to the mere fact of the, the, the buy and selling of properties. So just FYI. So don't get too far ahead of yourself. Not you, Mark, but, you know, I'm just saying to the board to pay attention to detail. Outside of that, I'll yield. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner. All right, Mark, um, you have anything else to add regarding the landscape? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. Look forward to seeing it tomorrow. Okay, with that being said, Board of Commissioners, I will certainly um, ask the, the attorney, uh, Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? Yes, ma'am, for all three, legal, real estate, and personnel, Madam Chair, Mark, can, Mark you can get McGill or Frederick, whoever you want to start with. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have a, do we have a motion to go into Madam, executive session? Point of, point of order, Madam Chair, okay. before uh -huh. you call the motion. Uh, just seeing that we're about to go into this, I, I believe we've got a committee meeting. Can you make the public aware that we may not come out in time? I'm not certain when we come out of that, but we will pick it up as soon as we come out. Can you make yes. sure that happens? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make it a, a public um, notification, public please, uh, and our citizens of Douglas County. Our uh, finance meeting is scheduled to start at 2 o'clock today, but however, we are running a little behind on our uh, in our work session and we're getting ready to go into executive session however we uh invite you to join us and i'm looking at maybe perhaps at the 230 235 uh, time frame uh certainly um communications director if you could just keep everyone posted and maybe uh, send out a, a mass email or something and put it out there so the citizens will know what time we will return with that being said uh, do we have a motion and i believe we said do we have a motion to go into executive session for the Second, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please let's start with District 1 and by re with your response. Yes. Commissioner Mitchell, District 1, yes. Kelly Robinson, District 2, yes. Terania Carthen, District 3, yes. Ann Jones Goddard, District 4, yes. Ramona Jackson Jones, Chairman of the Board of Commissioners, yes. We have a 5 0 unanimous vote, and the motion carries. Our Board of Commissioners, um, we will certainly chime off our system just briefly, and then we will return uh, to our, or we'll start our executive session. Mark, give us some instructions like you always do. What do you want us to do? Just yep. log off this meeting and stay on Microsoft Teams, and we'll call you in one by one. Okay, thank you. I don't know what that means. All right. Sound like we're ready to go. Well, good. Thank you, Board of Commissioners, for our executive session. And we uh, had a productive uh, meeting, and certainly our work session was very productive today. Uh, it was quite lengthy, but it was it was well worth it. It was very meaty and provided good information. And I look forward to our Board of Commissioners meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, are there any announcements from the Board of Commissioners before we we're finally in this meeting? Okay, if there, if there are no announcements, this meeting is adjourned and have a great day. Thank you, citizens of Douglas County. Finance Committee. Oh, I'll... Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. Kelly, Commissioner Robinson, sorry. So if there's two Microsoft